Recording. Okay, yeah, that should be recording. Uh, welcome. This is uh, week nine of uh, our 2.1, and we're going to finish Roman art in the first half. And uh, I'll show you just, you know, like 15 or 20 minutes of my uh, slides from Rome itself, one of which actually is on the syllabus anyway. So <clears throat> then we're going to take a break because uh, the other task, it's uh, equally important for tonight, is to go over the midterm and uh, cut down the list of slides that you'll need to know, the study list, I call that, cut that down by at least 40%. And then the same with the terms, uh, the list of terms. And then finally, uh, discuss how to study for the test, how it's going to be graded, uh, you know, how it's going to be given and, and graded. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think you already know, but the submission of it is, is, needs to be the same as a PDF. I actually wrote that all out. I'll have that up for you on the screen after the break when we do the review. And we don't want to rush through the review. It's too important. So that's why we are going to go ahead and take a break after all the Roman slides. But we could probably still end early, a little bit early. I don't know. It's hard to say 10, 15 minutes early, depending on how many questions you guys have. And that is what we're all here for. So don't hesitate to ask any questions um, during the review part of the uh, evening, which will be after the break. OK, uh, let's first ask, though, are there any questions about I sent back the grades from uh, some, but not all of the papers yet. I'm still waiting. One reader uh, is supposed to be returning those any time. And if not, I'll end up grading the rest of them. There's like six left, I think, that I haven't yet graded. Um, and I returned the ones that have been given back to me, either I graded or there's one reader that is working on this class with me. Okay, any questions? I just have a question. Sure. Is the midterm today? No, 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 it's next month. Oh. oh, good. Yeah, that would be uh, not very fair to all of you, but yeah, it's a little late. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm confused because I'm taking the other class too. So I was confused with the date. Sure, no, the good news then is you have a whole week to study for it. And it's open book, remember, open book or open uh, notes, however you want to look at it that way. I, I think of it as open notes because you don't need to have your book in front of you. You can if you want for the images, but you don't need to read the book or look through it or thumb through it while the slides are on the screen. The notes I gave will cover the meaning. And by now, everyone should know how to do formal analysis pretty well based on your... Well, at least most of you, and then I still have several people haven't turned in papers, probably a third of the class. That's a little high, but I'm going to tell you now, I'm, you know, wanting just for your own sake, for those of you who haven't yet turned in your first paper, to give you a little bit of a, a push or a boost to, to convince you don't wait much longer. You've got the midterm. If you can get it done before the midterm and then switch and study for, you know, a couple of days is enough usually to study for the midterm. Uh, pl please do that for your own sake, because you'll get backlogged or backed into yourself into a corner by uh, pushing things back too far, because the second paper is then due not that many weeks after, I think it's three weeks or less, and we're not meeting one week in November, if I recall, I think it is, might, might be a Wednesday. I can't, anyway, there is some kind of an administrative break, and, and also just because, you know, you got other classes, I assume, with other deadlines and assignments. And then there's finals and you don't want to wait till two days before or even a week before finals to do either one or two late papers plus any extra credits you may want to do plus study for the final. That's not a prescription for a good grade, I can tell you from past experience. So if you're one of the people who hasn't turned your first paper in, please do so as soon as possible. Okay, hang on, let me let... Okay, we're just starting. You haven't missed much. I just was saying next week will be the midterm and we're going to review after the break tonight. Uh, not so much review, uh, but just go ahead and uh, okay. Did you have any questions there? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when you said you're going to get the grades back to us, did you mean uh, you're going to email us directly, yes. or how do you? Okay. Yes, I've been emailing those that are that have been returned by the reader. Like I said, there's one reader I'm working with in this class. My largest class is like twice this size, so there I have more than one reader. But uh, I should be able to get. I, I would think no later than Friday, uh, the remaining grades back from those who were turned in on time, that is. If they weren't, they go to the back of the line and I get to them whenever I can get to them. And it's usually a week or so after I get them. The suspense is and killing that, me. I turned mine on on time. I'm just, I'm, I'm on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, 
Um, I just want to know, I'm not going to read anyone's grade out. That's against, you know, confidentiality uh, rules here. But go ahead and give me your last name again. I think I remember. Anderson. Is it Rob? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to be seen. So hang on. Oh, you can hammer me in front of the class. I don't care. Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I just, I haven't entered the grade yet. So give me a moment because uh, I have files in about eight places. You know, that's, I really don't like the fractured world we all live in, but it's a reality, obviously. So, um, you know, I just want to double check here. And I'm glad you brought this up because in a few cases this semester, more than the past two Zoom semesters, I call them, uh, for some reason, and I have no uh, doubt that when people tell me they sent the, their papers in on a certain time, whenever that was by the deadline or only a few days later, then that they should have been able to get uh, their grades back in. I'll go ahead and tell you, Rob, I don't see yours in the checklist of all the ones that I saw. Because well, I remember, I, I, don't, I don't panic, just resend it. Well, here's the thing. I sent it in like six hours before the deadline. And then like a day later, he said, hey, I only got a couple pages. And I, I went back and did it again like a That's what I didn't see. I remember that conversation. But I, did, I did. I did. Resend version. It. So what you need to do, it should be easy to prove. For, I'm just not just for any one student. <laughs> I'm not only speaking to any individual. But it, it, as I said, it's happened maybe as many as two or three papers in each of my three classes. Well, the Zoom classes, anyway, so that's two of the three I teach uh, that have gone astray. I don't know why, but it isn't the end of the world if you just, everyone has a record, an email trail that you can verify when you sent the paper. And now, if it was sent in incompletely, like missing a page or a bibliography or, or an illustration, then it does still qual qualify as late. You can resubmit that part of it that's missing or the whole thing actually the whole thing with whatever's missing i'm not assuming that's true for anyone you rob or anyone else i'm just saying if at this point i didn't get your paper it's not really anything that's going to cost you a, a loss of grade points if you just will send it back would make double sure it's because i did get a couple of files that were empty not in this class but in the other larger class a couple and I know those people thought they attached, and maybe they did, but somehow when the file arrived at either my inbox or one of my readers, whoops, there's nothing in it. So, uh, but if you have proof that you sent yours, and I know you you talked to me about it, so obviously I totally accept whatever, you know, you can uh, show. It just would show the original date that you submitted the paper as a PDF file, then that counts as on time. And I will grade it, oh, surely I'll have it done by Friday. Okay. okay. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Right maybe sooner. In fact, maybe tomorrow. And then I will email you your grade along with, you know, anyone else's whose papers I haven't yet received from that one reader, A or B, anyone who turns in a late paper. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question like that? Because then that's a good point to cover now before we start it on the slides, the remaining slides of Rome. Because, yeah, I mean, it can happen that a paper gets, I, you know, I don't know why. It's not worth speculating, but it isn't a disaster in any, by any means, if, if you just have, as everyone should have a record of when you originally sent the paper and you can resend it. So um, if anyone else wants to ask me, I can tell you I have a list here in front of me of the papers that were received, which ones have been graded, which ones are remaining to be graded. And that's how I just checked on yours, uh, Rob. So for whatever reason, I think I held off until for so, the second sending you might have sent. I don't doubt you did. I didn't see it. And that's not the end of the world. You could just do that tonight or even at the break, if you have a moment, uh, to Mark W., of course, at AOL, obviously, uh, not to my campus email, because that can cause problems. There have been some problems with Outlook uh, more than usual this semester. And that's why I avoid it at least for the time being this semester. I may go back to using it. Yes. Yes, OK. Um, OK, now L-O-K-E-N. Now I have to admit that isn't a name that rings a bell. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything at this point. But there are. there's another problem. Sometimes people submit things. I know, Rob, you didn't, I don't think. But sometimes people submit things under names that aren't the same as what's on the roster. Well, then I no, yeah, no, I, I was one of those guys. There we go. That is the root of the problem. I corrected it. I corrected the nickname. So Sarah, I don't see yours yet, but let me double check. 
And again, if you had sent it, you will have a record in there. Like I just said to everyone, not just any one of you, if that's the case. So hang on, let me see, because this we're talking about our 2.1 papers that were received and uh, logged in. Yes, yours, good news, Sarah, is yes, yours was received and on time. It's in the hands of that reader. And I'm going to go ahead and just tell her I already did. It's the first time I've ever had to wait more than 10 days. Well, two weeks is usually the turnaround time. I try. I can't guarantee that, you know, depending on how many papers I get all at once, A or B, how many late ones start dribbling in, or if there's problems like we're just discussing. But normally, if it's turned in on time, I can get your grades recorded within two weeks of the day I, I received the paper. Uh, so Sarah, the, here's my commitment to you. Yeah, it, it was received. It's on time. If I don't get your grade from the reader, I have it. Of course, I stored it. I'll grade it and get it back to you by the end of this week, maybe sooner, you know. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's what we're here for to clear up any questions you guys have. So maybe we should, let's do one last thing. Is there any urgent, that kind of question is rather, you know, uh, obviously important to, to resolve as soon as possible. So anybody else with that kind of a issue you want me to cl clarify about receiving papers? I have a question. Yes, sure, go ahead. Uh, sorry if I interrupted anybody. Um, can you check my last name, to see if you received it? I looked sure. through my sent emails and I'm not seeing mine, but I know that I finished it by the deadline. I don't know if I just didn't submit it. So last name Andrade. Okay, yeah, because I think I sent you your mid, no, it couldn't have been. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Hang on, hang on. I'll be able to tell you in less than uh, 45 seconds here. Um, yeah, and according to this, I returned it with the grade. At least that's what I have here. And I did these, I graded it myself. I remember, that's why I said your name rang a bell. First name McKenna. Uh -huh. McKenna Andrade. Yeah, I guess you did. Now that's a glitch at your end of whatever server it is you got, you have. So if you'll send me one more email, it's done. It's entered. It was on time. It was graded. I got another question. Okay. You, I, I, yet I, I don't know why you didn't see it when I sent it. I sent it sometime over the weekend, I think. I was okay. I see it now. For some reason, my phone email won't show it to me. Okay. Yeah, out. that's happening. A lot of people are getting emails and voicemails two or three days after they were sent by the... I got my email from you saying, yes, I got the whole paper this time. From yeah. you. <laughs> well, at this point, then, <laughs> do you want to be extra cautious? I'll send it again. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, but you see, that's part of the problem. If you're still sending it under a different name... But no, we sorted out the whole name thing. You said you got it. My name's on the paper. You just, but I changed the name in my email. Okay, um, that's but, what I'm saying. That causes it to get spammed out. Do you see? You see what I'm saying? No, but you're you're. I don't know your actual registered name. You got it though. The one you registered in, uh, you know, the first week of class or whenever you registered, is the only way that my. I have an automatic. It's taking a lot of time, but it's important. It automatically registers who's ever in the class whose name matches something in my roster. Uh, it's called the executive function or something. I paid extra for it and I renew it every year through Microsoft. It's an important function. Otherwise, I, you know, I guess I could just go through Canvas. Yes, but there are issues with Canvas I don't want to go into right now. I have nothing to do with you guys and your grades. Obviously, I'm not using Canvas. I made that clear from before the class started. So that isn't even a possibility right now. If, uh, Rob, I know you send in. So it's not going to be an issue about timing okay. credit. But if you send it, the next second time, whatever it was, you reset it. And in any way, the email handle wasn't your actual name, or at least, you know, your part of your name. I understand what you're saying, but you actually communicated to me. We sorted it out. You're like, I got your paper. So I, I would assume that you moved it to a, a known location at that point, but I'll yeah. send it again. Yeah, I'll double check because I didn't delete it. I'm sure of that. Okay. So why don't you just do this rather than have to resend the paper, just send me a reminder of one line email saying, please double check and then I'll get back yeah. to you, not tonight. <laughs> All <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I sign off at 9.30 and th then I try to catch up on my family. What were they doing all these hours? I've been locked in this <laughs> bedroom, trying to get my students up to speed and myself also caught up. Okay, sorry, Rob. So so it shouldn't be a problem for me to get right. back to you tomorrow to confirm with the grade. <laughs> I mean, right. uh, obviously I should be able to do that. All right. <laughs> 
oh, well, that you email me and I give you the total points. And I tell you what that means in terms of letter grade individually, one on one. Yeah, you can do that anytime during the semester. That's always, a, and I think that's in that first week I sent everyone the course policies and grading mm -hmm. procedures or something, for, you know, that two page handout. So now, now you know, yes, you just email me and, and I'll get back to you usually within 24 hours with whatever your grade is at that point, total points and letter grade, okay? All right, let's get started with tonight's uh, topic. And I'm gonna have to ask one little bit of help from all of you, which is, I know we didn't cover this slide uh, because uh, I remember stopping. Oh, here we go. Good timing, all right? Well, yeah, uh, but here's, here's the thing. I can't remember, I know I skipped a little bit ahead, uh, I think. So what, what was the last slide I showed, A, and B, uh, you guys can see this. Uh, did we cover? We covered the Coliseum, right? Right. Yes. That's what I remember. Affirmative. And we talked about these, but there, there were that was the must, the last other must, second to the last. I mean, must know. I think this right, which is I'm pretty sure we covered it. Right. Yeah, we did. Yeah, good. We did. The reason I'm asking is. The files differ between the ones that were stored from before the pandemic. I thought they were identical. They should be, but for some reason they're not with what slides are, are in each file for the Roman art lectures from the in-person class, which are stored in the computer in a classroom, obviously. And it turns out they're not the same file. So I, I didn't show exactly the same set of slides in my in-person R2.1. So that's what's causing the uncertainty. And I, I appreciate your... So, so in other words, what we still have to cover is this very important. And did we cover this? The art yes. Oh, we did. I thought so. That's my, but we didn't in the class that I teach in person. We covered that. Yeah. And I don't think we covered this though, the Colosseum. Mm. I mean, not the Colosseum, the column. I'm sorry, the column. Yeah, I don't think we did that. No. And we didn't do the, uh, I know we didn't do the um, horse of, uh, that's Marcus Aurelius on his horse. And that's that's part of the syllabus. Okay, that's pretty clear then. We're, we're actually in very good shape. We may be able to end earlier than I would have expected, but we are gonna take a break because I wanna be focused and I want you to be focused on any questions that could come up when we discuss how to take the exam, you know, and how it's gonna be great. Okay, here we go. This is a really important slide. I'm telling you right up front, the odds are very high that it uh, could be along with the Coliseum. Uh, and the, um, uh, let's see, Augustus of Prima Porta from last week. Uh, very high possibility. One of those, not all three, would be on the midterm. Okay, this is the, some of you already know what it is. Uh, the Pantheon, P-A-N-T-H-E-O-N, one word, Pantheon, Rome. And the date is 125. AD now we're talking about, or CE if you prefer. Boy, it's it's impossible to overstate the importance of this building. Here are the first few facts that you wanna know in case it's only midterm and you ought to know about it anyway, especially if you ever gonna go to Rome. Has anybody here been inside this, the Pantheon? I think one or two people said they had, okay, maybe not in this class. Well, if you go to Rome, you gotta, you gotta spend at least an hour. <laughs> Uh, or oh, more if you have the time, because there's some great guided tours in just about every major language, at least every European language, uh, being given every hour inside. But even if you don't have a guide to go through it and just a guidebook or a good memory from this class, I think it'll mean a lot more to you once you know what you're looking at. So what are we looking at? First of all, we're looking at a temple that's named, the exact name of it is a temple to all the gods. That's literally the translation from Latin of the word pantheon. It's a temple to all the gods. Of course, we're talking about the Roman gods, which were the same as the Greek gods, remember? So you can say the Greek and or Roman or Greco-Roman gods, all of them. You, in other words, you could go inside this one temple and pray to any one of the gods or more than one that you wanted to. And supposedly they'd hear your prayer. If you, you know, believe that. <laughs> religious you know teachings where you're that you know if you go to the right temple and you pray to a specific god that god will hear you but what if you want to pray to more than one or you just happen to be living in the part of rome near this temple well then you can go into this temple and pray to any god you want so it's the temple of all the gods the second thing i think in some ways is the most surprising this was the largest domed building ever built in the roman empire 
the largest domed building ever built uh, by the, you could say by the Roman Empire because it was built. What was, who, who directed it to be built? Well, it's replacing an older temple that Augustus had originally had constructed, also called the Pantheon, but it was smaller than this. So a much larger temple was erected on this site. The one that you're looking at is not in any way a recreation or a replica. And that might be the most mind boggling fact of all, everything in this building that you can see in this slide. And when you go there in person is authentic and original. The columns, the pediment, remember these words, that's the portico. So that in this slide, it would, you'd need to know those words if it was on the slide and not essay part, the uh, pediment. Right, and there's no, they didn't have any statues in this particular, but there, there's too many gods, so they couldn't fit them all in. I guess they just left it blank. And then we have the uh, drum, that's what this is called, the base of the dome, and then the dome, which is the original dome. And of course, the Romans invented domes. This is all part of the meaning now, so hopefully you're getting all this. They, there are two things this building, well, there are more than two, but two major factors about the construction that only the Romans could do because no one had thought of them before. First, the dome itself is a Roman invention. And then to me, the most perhaps surprising thing of all, let's get back down, is that they used concrete and it's the original concrete dome intact without any portion of it having to be replaced or repaired. I mean, minor repairs like cracks here and there, water leaks occasionally, but over 2000 year old dome is still in place. I don't know about uh, any of the rest of you, but when I look at this slide, obviously professional from a helicopter, I, I didn't take this one. You're looking down at a very modern looking, doesn't it look like the dome on many modern buildings? Well, of course the techniques are the same. The Romans invented concrete and domes and they applied both new inventions to this building. Now the walls were originally lined in marble, just like the Colosseum. The marble was stolen from the walls by later popes. Well, just say popes, there were no popes in 125 AD. So by popes later on, after the fall of Rome, you can say that, uh, during the Middle Ages. And several churches in this neighborhood were built from the marble from the walls stolen off or taken off the wall of the original walls of the Pantheon. So that's another rather remarkable. And then you have, this, what is that? That's a 30 foot wide opening called the oculus. That's Latin for eye, oculus. You don't have to worry about how it's spelled. It's got two C's, you know, O-C-C-U-L-U-S. Anyway, so right at however it sounds, but an oculus is part of the meaning, is a, a unique feature to this dome. It's not typical of other dome buildings in Rome or any later domes because you might think, well, what's that for? Is that, then they're just going to let rain in? There? And it rains quite a bit in Rome during the winter. That's part of the effect, but it's not the purpose. The purpose of the whole is so you can look up and see the gods that you're praying to. And here's a painting of how it looked in the 1700s. That hole was deliberately placed there so that the worshipers inside this building could look all the way up into the heavens, you know, up into the skies where the, supposedly the gods resided. And you, you could uh, pray to them more directly. And then they supposedly could answer your prayer if they felt like it uh, more easily because their answers, their prayer supposedly could come directly to you through the opening, the oculus. Okay, but there's a couple more facts about the meaning. The size of the dome is remarkable. I said it was the largest dome building ever built by the Roman Empire. Well, how big was it? This is part of the meaning, right, still. It was 144 feet tall by 142 feet wide. So you could just say over 140 feet tall and over 140 feet wide, meaning a 14-story skyscraper could be put inside this building and not touch the top. The average height of every floor on a skyscraper, at least modern ones, is 10 feet. So you can do the math, right? 140 foot tall building could fit inside here and still not quite touch the top of the dome. That should surprise you. And then we have the columns. The columns are imported from Egypt. They're Egyptian marble. And they are 50 feet tall. I think you could tell by looking at these people here are dwarfed by these columns. 
So there's some of the, not the largest columns ever used on any building in ancient Rome, but some of the tallest columns. That's pretty much enough to, to, to establish why this building is so important. But if it isn't obvious, I'll go ahead and add one more thing, which has to do with our current world culture. This building is studied by architects all over the world. Any architect who gets a degree from a really highly respect, let's say one of the major architecture schools, there's only a few dozen in the whole world. There's maybe a dozen in this country, if that. And there's a couple in England and France, and of course, China has a few. Uh, but people come from all over the world. Architecture students come from all over the world to study this building and to learn the, about how it was constructed. And then the style of it, the last fact I, I'll give you now on the meaning is that the style of this building is very influential for dome buildings uh, all around the world. It's not the exact prototype of uh, you know something like US Capitol building, that's more based on Renaissance styles of dome buildings. But the Renaissance, remember that's a period from 1400s in Italy, right when Da Vinci and Michelangelo came along. So this building helped spur or inspires a better word, inspire the revival of classical art and architecture that is called the Renaissance. It helped inspire it because it never disappeared. This building was never buried. It was never damaged. It didn't have to be rebuilt. It's the original building. If you're curious about this, it's not something you have to know if it's on the exam, but this says Marcus Agrippa constructed this edifice or building. He was the engineer uh, for um, the Emperor Hadrian when this was built. Uh, this is during the golden age of the Roman Empire. I held up, didn't I? I, think I did. Uh, a summary of the, uh, of the facts about the Roman Empire that it, uh, it, it had 50 countries or nations under its rule uh, with 50 different languages, right? Uh, and 200 and some say 220, so somewhere over 200 million population when the whole globe had less than half a billion, so nearly half, at least 40 over 45% of the world's, or about 45% of the world's population was under one empire. It's not part of the meaning of this, it's just the context And if you weren't here last week. Um, and so this building then would have been inspirational throughout that whole rest of the Roman empire. This is built during the golden age of the power and wealth of the and physical extent of that empire. So you see dome buildings that were inspired by this, um, or you would have then, not too many survive, and if they do, they're usually reconstructed. And then other after the fall of the Roman Empire, this building survived intact, as we just said. So it continued to be an inspiration for over almost now, not quite 2,000 years. It has still inspired architects uh, and buildings designed on every continent. Um, even a few places in Australia, one or two of my friends have been there recently said, yeah, I saw some classical buildings. and. Melbourne or, you know, whatever, Sydney, and some of them clearly had some Roman-like features. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. Let's do the formal analysis. If it's on the exam, this is the view you'll have, right? You'll see the whole view, though. I, I think it's, it's, yeah, I can't quite use the large. I might do that while you're writing, but I don't want to distract you. So it'll just probably be this view. But that's, that's enough to see the whole structure. So here we go. It's completely symmetrical, of course. And even though in this picture, it looks like the portico, which you could include the pediment, because that's all one structure. That looks like the largest mass, but no, the largest mass is the walls. The proof of that is in the next picture. Then the dome, and then the uh, portico. Whoops, there's the portico, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, look how big this building is. I mean, it's just remarkable to have survived, to have ever been built and not needed to be repaired or restored. Yeah, you can see that that portico is nowhere near as big as the walls. So the walls are the largest uh, mass, if you break it down into three sections, then the dome and then the portico. Okay, uh, but we're going back to the uh, view that would be on the exam. It's uh, got cool colors gray right off white and gray on the concrete and the portico but the walls what's left of the, the outer walls of course they're intact is the brick what's under was underneath originally marble brick is always warm so that's a warm color the textures are the real smooth texture of marble real smooth texture of concrete 
and real rough texture of brick. There are no simulated textures. The modeling, of course, is the shadows created by the sun in this photo. It's just in the portico beneath the columns or behind the columns. Uh, and that's natural modeling. There is carved line here, the inscription. You don't have to know what it says for the exam, but that's I already told you what that means. So you could just say the letters carved on the portico are the only uh, carved line and the rest is visual line. You know, at the corners here of the, of the facade and along the edges of the uh, pediment. And even here in the dome, that forms a kind of visual line. So those are all the kinds of lines that a building has naturally not drawn or carved uh, in those areas. And then we have, uh, I said it's balanced left to right, but some people would argue it's weighted toward the bottom because the dome is narrower. So I wouldn't argue, but it depends on where you draw the line. If you draw the line here, that section and the bottom, I would say are, are balanced, roughly balanced. It's definitely 100% symmetrical left to right. So that is obviously a balance in that direction. The rhythm, very clearly powerful rhythm with the columns uh, and the ridges on the dome. There actually are windows here, but you can't really see them. So you don't have to write about that. Uh, and, and the pediment, right? The triangular pediment has, you know, decorative, decorative detail there. You can see it better. So there's plenty of rhythm. It's stable on the, the uh, columns and uh, dynamic just about everywhere else. The pediment's dynamic, the, the curved outer walls, and of course the dome are all dynamic features. Uh, let's see, am I forgetting anything else? Rith oh, space, well, it's real space, 144 foot tall, open domed room. One large, you could say round if you want, but you don't even have to say that, one large open room with a, a, a dome about 144 feet tall. Pretty remarkable. Okay, let's move on now to, we covered that, right? Yeah. This is the column of Trajan or Trajan. People pronounce it both ways. Uh, and this one is near the bottom of the list. Uh, excuse me, the notes got a little tangled up. Here we go. Um, column of Trajan, and I'll spell that for you. Column, of course, some of you already know it's C O. L-U-M-N and Trajan, the Roman emperor that built it, T-R-A-J-A-N, column of Trajan or Trajan, Rome, the location, and the date is 113 AD. Okay, oh, I know we still have the Arapakis to look at. Yeah, so we do still have three more must knows. Okay, and th that's what we're gonna see when we go to my own slides of Rome. Okay, so what is this? It's a victory column. There's no other word for it, but in this view, I have a better view of it in my own slides, but I don't go back and forth and slow down your note taking because we want to keep moving ahead and not have to cut down the time for reviewing on the midterm. Okay, so it's part of, it's, it's a detail from 130 foot tall marble victory column. It commemorates a military victory Anybody see the news recently? I don't know if anybody even looks at newspapers anymore, but in my newspaper and my wife gets the Wall Street Journal, I get the San Francisco Chronicle, <laughs> very different newspapers. Both of them had front page photos of a riot, a big riot in downtown Rome. And the column, sorry, the column, this column is in the, the photos that were on the news. It was also on CNN last night. Um, they were rioting, some of them over, you know, the anti-vaxxers. Right? <laughs> anyway, whatever, you know, it's the point is not about who it was that was rioting. It's that they chose this column as a rallying point to try and protest or to protest, not try. They did protest. Unfortunately, it turned violent. About 100 people were arrested. Um, the, the government requirements for max, uh, vaccine mandates. And this column is shown on the news coverage of that riot. It's, it's clearly standing above the crowd because it's 130 feet tall, again, a marble column built by the Emperor Trajan to commemorate a military victory. Which one? The victory over the Dacians. That's a pretty important part of the meaning. Obviously, if this was on the exam, you'd need to remember that. The Dacians, it's, uh, I don't have a board to write it on, so I'll just spell it for you. D-A-C, 
D-A-C-I-A-N, the Dakians. It was Dakia, the province, and the Dakians were not, not very compliant. <laughs> they didn't leave the Roman alone. They attacked the Roman Empire's borders repeatedly. And you know how the Romans dealt with that. Uh, we covered this last week with the Jewish rebellion. They crushed any rebellion uh, after maybe one warning they might give. So they did that with the Dacians. Trajan invaded Dacia and thought he had a you know, arranged for peace between the two. So he withdrew. And guess what? The Dakians rebelled again or attacked the empire's borders. And the next time the Romans came in, they just wiped out every single living. Well, I think they sold the women and children into slavery. That's usually what they did. And all the adults were, were uh, massacred. It took them two years. And this co uh, column chronicles that campaign. There you go. This column chronicles the campaign of the conquest. There we go. This column chronicles the conquest, that's the right alliteration for tonight, of Dacia by the Roman army. And where is Dacia? My God, look how far it is. Look at a map from Italy. It's a thousand miles. It's on the borders of Russia. It's Eastern Europe. That's really a far distance. That's how large the Roman Empire was, that they actually got all the way into Eastern uh, Europe, what today is Romania. And if anyone knows anything about Romania, two things. One, that's where Dracula came from. Yeah, there was such a person. He wasn't a vampire, obviously, but a warrior. A, but more important, these are the descendants of the Roman settlers who were brought in to replace the massacred uh, inhabitants. That's the basic fact. That's maybe the most important to remember. Today, Romania is the only country in Eastern Europe that speaks a Latin-based language. So that's how they got the name Romania, right? So, the Romans conquered them, so, wiped out the fighting age population, sent the children and women probably into slavery, and then repopulated, that's a short way to say it, the entire province, which was, yeah, it's a pretty big country. It's one of the bigger countries. Look at that in Europe. It's, so was Vlad the Impaler of uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a guy where, yeah. Was, was he of him. Roman descent then? Yeah, yeah, well, he's the origin for the legend of Dracula. But, but you don't when, need to write that because that's after the Roman Empire. But, yeah, but what I'm saying is, was he a, uh, so he was basically a replacement citizen. Yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah, he spoke a, a Romance language. Wow. That's what the name Romania it means it was reconquered and, sorry, conquered and repopulated by the Romans under Trajan. And, and, you know, they had their own shortage, housing shortage, whatever you want to call it. Overpopulation is a short way. Italy was extremely crowded. Uh, it isn't exactly unpopulated now, but, 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 you know, per capita, however you want to say it in your notes, the population was just overcrowding the Italian peninsula. And so, of course, that's the homeland of the Roman Empire, obviously, that's where Rome is. So they needed room to expand and send literally, I don't know, millions, it, 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 probably at least a million, but you don't have to write the number down, just say thousands, hundreds of thousands, there we go, that's a safe number, hundreds of thousands of Roman citizens were resettled in what once was Dacia and it then became the Roman province of Romania. And to this day, those people speak a Romance language. They are descendants, yes, of the Romans, although many of them intermarried with the gypsies, and so you've got a very different looking population in Romania than you do in most of Italy. But there are plenty of gypsies in Italy too, right? They're all over Europe. So later on, there were some changes, you know, the Russians invaded, the Turks invaded. I mean, yeah, of course, 2000 years later, the people living there are mixed race now in Romania, but they were for centuries directly descended from Italy and therefore Romans, a European Roman population. And that wouldn't have happened without this uh, invasion. So this depicts the invasion and that's Neptune. There he is watching over or guarding the Roman soldiers as they invaded. See, they're crossing the river, the Danube, by the way, it's the biggest river in Europe. I'm sure you've all heard of it, right? The Blue Danube Waltz by um, Strauss. Sorry, I have to wet my throat. I started to get dry throat here. So this shows every phase of the invasion of the campaign, you could say to conquer or the conquest, if you wanted to say it that way, of Dacia by the Romans. The first, you know, invading, you know, soldiers crossing 
on a bridge. They made, it doesn't matter, you could say it if you want to, boats. They used their boats to create a bridge. They didn't want to stop and build a bridge. There wasn't one, so they made a boat bridge. And then they started building forts to attack all the different Dakian, uh, you know, cities or towns. So they're building forts here. And then further up, uh, you can't really quite see here, but there's a battle scene. So just say there are over, this is the last fact about the meaning. There are over 5,000 figures, roughly one third life size. And of course it should be obvious by now, everybody recognizes it. It's a bas relief a panel of, of set, I'm sorry. And they're spiraling up this 130 foot tall column. And those scenes are different scenes from the two year campaign to conquer the Dakians starting with the invasion and ending, I'm sure, with the surrender and uh, you know, the final conquest at the top of the column. So it's, it's like a storyboard. Somebody said in my uh, in-person class last week when I showed this slide, you could say it's kind of a storyboard or you can say it's like a, you know, a continuing scene, set of scenes, sorry, that are depicting each phase of that campaign. And it's the Last fact about me now, this should be obvious. Uh, well, let me ask anybody, can anybody think of, or not think of, but can anybody say whether or not you think or have you heard there are any victory columns anywhere else in the world besides ancient Roman ruins and this one in Rome? It's not in ruin, it's the original column, it's still standing on its original base. France? Yeah, yes, oh, oh, excellent answer. All over Paris, there are victory columns. Mm -hmm. They they were because Napoleon Napoleon had a, a a hang up about the Romans. He thought of himself as a modern day what was then of course modern Roman emperor. Yeah, so there's several in Paris, and there's a couple in London, and I think that there there is one in San Francisco. Anybody know where it is? And you can take pictures of it if you care to before the final exams week, and get ten points extra credit for photos of it. Anybody know where it is? It's right in the heart of San Francisco. Been there for over a hundred years. Nobody knows. Coit Tower. Sorry, mm -hmm. no, go ahead. What? Coit, Coit Tower? <laughs> no, that's not a victory column. <laughs> that's a monument to firefighters. No, it's different. No, the, the Dewey column. The, they just they just call it the, the victory column, I think is the nickname. Right in the heart of Union Square. Can't miss it. It's it's as big as this one. Solid marble commemorates the victory of the US Navy over the Spanish. Or the conquest of the Philippines, if you want to say it that way, because that's what happened. We took them over and then we said, you know what, we're going to keep you guys as a colony for oh, 50 years or so. Yeah, so the Philippines, that battle, that, that campaign uh, is commemorated by a victory column right here in the Bay Area. What was the name? It's in Union Square. I know you all know about the Spanish American War, right? Or do they not teach these things? And I don't know what they're teaching anymore. I mean, that's a pretty major turning point when we decide to become a colonial power openly, not just, you know, obviously through other ways. But prior to that, 1898, right? That was the year that America joined the colonial race. But there weren't many colonies left to conquer. So we took Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines from Spain. And they all three became at least temporarily colonies. And so that's a victory column to a conquest of uh, 1898. It's been there for what? That's well over 100 years, 120 now. Yeah, it's the only victory column I know of on the West Coast. But there are some back East, like New York. I think there's at least one. Washington, D.C., I'm sure there's at least one. Yeah, they're, they're all over the world. But this is one of the first, if not the first, major or large victory column. It's Not many can be this big. OK, let's wrap up this with a formal analysis. It's a cool gray color. The simulated texture is superb on the soldiers, their uniforms, uh, <coughs> excuse me, their hair, and the fortresses they're building, <coughs> their boats everywhere. It's super realistic, of course. And uh, it's done all with carved line, obviously. There's no other kind of line. Uh, the figures are one third life size, but for space, it's overlapping that's i see some foreshortening actually i do on these i didn't used to think of that but if you look at these for uh, diminishing size there's some diminishing size on the bottom panel at least this is the bottom panel you're looking at here and then uh there is overlapping of course of the soldiers over each other and over the forts behind them so uh some foreshortening I guess you could say, yeah, a little bit, not much, but there's definitely a diminishing size here. But most of it, that's only overlapping because the, the next several 
I don't know how many it is spirals it's probably 30 different scenes um, that, that you could see if you walk around and look up uh, you, you can see I think here that uh, there's only overlapping really in most of the panels but on the bottom panel there is some diminishing size and I guess a little bit of foreshortening uh, the modeling is obvious. It's, it's a bow relief panel, so of course it wouldn't be visible without the modeling. It's very strong modeling on all the figures from the sun, obviously. Uh, and then we have the balance. I'd say each scene is balanced. Now these soldiers, to some people, seem but, but look, this is all full here. You've got the waves of the ocean, not the ocean, the river, sorry, crashing over the the bank here of the of the river, or maybe that is the river bank. Because you see Neptune's rising up out of the water is what's happening. And then you have these forts. It, there's no empty space here. So it's balanced left to right and top to bottom. All the panels are. The rhythm is obvious with the heads, hands, arms, legs, and uh, stone blocks, of course, in each panel. Um, let's see. Am I, I think I've covered everything. Oh, there's no really large. Well, you could say Neptune is the largest mass if you want to look at it that way in the bottom panel. And then I don't think it's really, I mean, maybe if you count that as one mass, all the boats tied tied together, supposedly, I guess you could call it a second largest mass. And then each soldier, the soldiers are all about the same size. So the, so the upper panels, certainly this one, you, you wouldn't have to describe the third one. All of the soldiers are about the same size. So there's no larger, smaller masses in most of these panels. Okay. Um, oh, and it's stable on most of the details, except one or two soldiers that are leaning over, but most of them are standing upright. You see that the vast majority are. And the buildings, obviously all of the fort, uh, fortresses are, are stable. So there's really not much dynamic. I mean, this is supposed to be the wave above his head. <laughs> it's not a jump rope. <laughs> One of my students said they thought it looked like Neptune is jumping rope in the middle of the Danube. No, it's just supposed to be water cresting above him as he goes bobbing up out of the deep. <laughs> so you could just say, okay, that one detail and the heads, I guess, of each soldier, uh, those are dynamic. But mostly with the exception of a handful of individual soldiers, they're almost all standing upright and all the structures behind them are stable. Okay, this is the second to the last must know, and then we'll switch to my selection of slides, which includes one more must know that is one I won't cut from the study list, probably. We'll see how it goes after the break. Okay, so we have two more new must knows uh, before we, uh, you know, take a break and, and review. This one is the last one on your list for this week, equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, the equestrian. <clears throat> A word that I imagine many of you know from experience. I've only ever ridden a horse once in my life and I fell off. <laughs> in England one time, some friends of mine had a, <clears throat> a ranch somewhere. Well, they called it an estate. Equestrian means of and having to do with horses, of course. So it's a statue of the emperor Marcus Aurelius on his horse. The spelling of those words is, uh, first word is E-Q-U-E-S-T-R-I-A-N. Equestrian statue, of course, of Marcus. I think everyone knows how to spell that. Aurelius, A U R E L I U S, Rome, 175 AD. Marcus Aurelius is considered the last emperor of the Pax Romana. If you do the, the math, that's 200 years after Augustus founded the Roman Empire. I mean, we covered him last week. I told you what that means. That's a word that would be useful. It's very likely something you would have to remember, but it'd be helpful to know as part of the meaning of any of these slides of, of a Roman art that were created during that period. It's a 200 year period. You know, Augustus takes the throne in 30 BC, becomes the emperor, first emperor, and then Marcus Aurelius, Aurelius dies in 180. You don't have to know those years, but that's 210. That's more than 200 years. After him, the empire slowly began to decline, and then it had a couple of more uh, revivals. I mean, it didn't just disappear. It lasted another 250 years. The Roman Empire lasted, remember, over 500 years. He was last Marcus Aurelius. What period did you say? Well, you don't have to know the years, but if you want to, that the, the Pax, P-A-X, Romana, R-O-M-A-N-A. -A. I think I covered that last week, but I didn't write it down. I just said it. It's, it's the beginning of the, pair, the period of peace 
and prosperity. There we go. Peace and prosperity. Say that fast for your tongue. <laughs> the Pax Romana was a period of peace and prosperity. It's a good thing I'm not in person. They'd be spit all over the people in the front. I'm kidding. It's on my screen. I'm kidding. It's not. It just, you say that fast several times. You can't help it. <clears throat> I'll say it again. This is the last he, Marcus Aurelius. It's a statue of the last emperor to reign during the Pax Romana. After him, things began to slowly de deteriorate. I don't know the other word for it. Slowly decline. Yes, yeah, there's the word. The beginning of the fall of the Roman Empire began after him. So he ruled during a time of peace and prosperity, of course, just like the first Roman emperor 200 years earlier, uh, Augustus. But when you look at this statue, it's twice life size. So that's another fact about it. It's colossal. That means, you know, larger than life. But in this case, literally twice life size. And he's on his favorite horse. And it's in front of the Roman city hall. Why is it there? Because that's not where it was placed. There was no Roman city hall. The Romans didn't have city governments like we think of them today. You know, they had governors and mayors, but not, you know, nobody had power that the government didn't allow them. There was no elections, right? So why is it in front of the city hall? Because it was placed there by the Catholic church when it was found during the Renaissance. This statue, in other words, was buried for over 15 centuries, or you could just say 1500 years. And when it was found again in the, I don't know, 1600s, anyway, in the late Renaissance, you can just say Renaissance. Don't ask me to spell Renaissance. <laughs> we got to keep moving. Uh, during the Renaissance, when it was refound, it was misidentified as a statue of the first Christian emperor, Constantine. We're going to get to him after the midterm. That'll be the first must know slide right after the midterm. Don't forget that night you don't just disappear during the break. You need to come back because there will be slides that could be on the final right after the break, right next week. Okay, so in other words, I'll summarize again. When this was found about 1500 years after it was, you know, buried or lost during the Renaissance, it was replaced in this plaza by the Catholic Church because they thought it was a statue of the first Christian emperor, but it's not. Marcus Aurelius, however, was a benign despot. He did not persecute people because of their religion. In fact, he temporarily halted the persecution of the Christians. I don't know if it was during his whole 20 years. He ruled 20 years. It's a long time back then for an emperor. Um, and he's the one, don't write this, in the movie The Gladiator, right? Or just is it Gladiator without the, the, yeah, in that movie, Joaquin Phoenix is supposedly his son and Richard Harris plays Marcus Aurelius. That's the character played at the beginning of that movie that supposedly was uh, suffocated, which isn't how he died, <laughs> by his own son. <clears throat> uh, in any case, Marcus Aurelius was a very important, powerful, and popular. There we go. There's some more alliteration. <laughs> important, popular, and powerful <laughs> emperor. There, uh, yeah, he was. He was very popular uh, because he was tolerant. He was tolerant. So it turns out they didn't figure out who it was until a couple hundred years later. I don't, I don't know when, sometime in the last couple hundred years, somebody said, wait a minute, that's not Constantine. That's the other guy that was 150 years earlier. Uh, he wasn't a Christian, but he didn't persecute the Christians either. So they left it here. They said, what the heck? You know, he was enlightened and he was a benign despot. And so, you know, he's considered, you know, one of the best Roman emperors, no question. Okay, that's plenty of meaning. Formal analysis, completely balanced. I would say if you draw the line, of course, here across the middle of the horse, it, it's balanced. Uh, and then you have it's almost entirely stable. There's the, the uh, I mean, his arms out at a right angle, his head and body is straight upright, the legs of the horse, one leg is raised, but look, even it is at a right angle. His legs are, it, it's almost entirely stable, except for the, his, the top of his head and the horse's head, of course. The biggest mass, pretty easy, the horse then the emperor, and then the base. That's the original base. This is the later one added. It's a uh, cool green color now, but it wasn't originally. It was marble, which, I'm sorry, not marble. I'm sorry, bronze, I meant. And the bronze shows through, at least in this photo, but they've taken it out of the plaza, by the way. It was rusting. It was getting damaged by acid rain and this. A lot of pollution in Rome. So they moved it inside a museum and it's a replica now in that plaza. You don't have to write that, but you could if you want to, if it's on the exam. Okay, so we have, um, let's see, for space, it's twice life size. So that means that if he stood up, he'd be 12 feet tall. 
okay? And there is one technique for space, of course, overlapping of him over the horse and his clothes over his body. Uh, then there's Simia Texture, what's well, superb, probably the best sculptor in Rome did this. Of course, if you were commissioned to do a portrait of the emperor, you'd have to have a pretty good skill, right? To do the hair, the face, the clothing, right? And the horse's body. And that's all done with carved line. Everyone knows how bronze is created, right? From a mold, uh, of course, originally done in clay. I think everyone knows that. So the line is carved. Not it's cast technically, but the original line that creates the semi texture was all colored line. Okay, uh, and let's see uh, balance rhythm. Yeah, the rhythm is obvious. I think with the arms, hands, uh, legs of the horse, quite a bit of rhythm. Um, okay, let's see. I think yeah, this is for next. This is for next week. So here's what we're gonna do. We're uh, taking this stop share and then we're going to go to because there's one more must know that uh, we definitely need to look at i've got a quick question about sure, the last please, now's a good time go ahead while i uh, i may maybe i missed it but did you talk about modeling for that one no i didn't you're right uh the modeling whoops i mean that's when it disappears like that uh, the modeling is overlapping <laughs> the modeling is uh is from the sunlight there's no technique for modeling on his clothes, you know, and uh, his, uh, not much on the horse, mostly on his body. It's just natural sunlight modeling. Okay, so I guess I have to do this this way now. Let's get to this. There we go. Um, I'm looking for, there we go. Oh, why does it keep disappearing? Now that's the first time it's done that on me. Okay, we'll just do it this way. Then we'll go back to this, that, that'll work. There we go. There's one more must note. Don't put your notes away yet, but you're going to just relax now for the, the next several minutes. And we're going to talk about what the city of Rome looks like in real life if you go there. Now, these are old slides, but it hasn't changed that much. The Roman section, the ancient quarter, they call it. This is the Roman Forum. And uh, these marble columns were built by Augustus, one of the first temples he built to the god of war. The Romans, of course, worshiped the god of war, Mars, right? The planet Mars is named after. And so here we have a marble. What was all that's left is the portico now, uh, a temple that once was a full, you know, complete structure dedicated to the Roman god of war, Mars, by Augustus while he was emperor. In the distance, if it's not obvious, is the Colosseum. We're going to go take a walk up to it as we go along. You don't have to take notes yet. There's one slide you will have to toward the end here. All right, and then this is the Roman road system. It's the beginning of the system of roads that run all around the entire, by the way, I didn't say it was two and a half square, two and a half million square miles, which would make it the fourth largest. We haven't seen a single picture yet. Uh, yeah, I don't, think, uh, uh -oh. I don't think you're screen sharing. Uh -oh. Yeah. oh, I know what happened. <laughs> You guys just need to, to holler earlier then i apologize for that first slide not being... oh, we didn't want to interrupt you <laughs> no 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 it's important that's fine okay so uh, i know what to do we just got yeah I, I'm, I just forgot it's too much on my mind these days okay so what we do is get rid of this and get back to where i can see the share screen mode and that should allow it once i do this to appear on your screens, I hope, because it says you are screen sharing now. Everybody's yeah, that's good. Good. So that's the, I don't need to repeat everything. That's the uh, portico of the God temple to the God of war, Mars. And obviously that's a Colosseum, we'll get up to it. And then this is what I was saying just a moment ago is the beginning of the Roman road system. All roads lead to Rome where they all led to the Colosseum, I'm sorry, to, they all led to the um, forum. You know, the word forum is still used to this day. Some of you may know that, right? There's a place in LA called the forum, which is <laughs> pathetic. It's from the 60s. It's supposed to look like this uh, Coliseum. It's a racetrack. I think they still use it as a live horse racing track. Uh, but the word forum is still used by cities all over the world. It's a Latin word. It means to come together. So this is the government quarter, you could say it where all the government buildings were. <laughs> okay, so let's move quickly through the next several slides and we get to the first must know, or the last must know, I'll tell you uh, in time to get you know, but for now you don't have to take notes. So this is one of the few intact temples left in the forum. 
So let's go up to that slowly. This is the hill on which all of the wealthy, or not all, but many of the wealthier uh, rulers, the ruling class, many of the emperors lived on that hill and their wives, they usually had separate houses from each other and entertained whatever companions they wanted. That was just the lifestyle of the ruling classes in Rome. Almost all of them, except Marcus Aurelius, because he had a, a happy marriage and a faithful relationship with his wife. In fact, that's what this temple is. So let's get to that. Um, and okay, so then I couldn't oh. couldn't resist it. Sorry, I'm obviously I'm a cat lover. There are more cats in Rome than people. When I was there, there was seven, six or seven million people in Rome and eight million cats because they take a census. <laughs> I think it's every few years of the cats and the people, of course. And now it's something like ten million cats and eight million people. I don't wait. There's a whole population of cats that, of course, the tourists keep feeding. So, This is that temple we saw a moment ago that Augustus dedicated. He had a phrase, a saying, a motto, whatever you want to call it, a slogan. There we go. I found Rome a city of brick, but I left her a city of marble. And that says everything. He rebuilt almost every temple in the forum that wasn't already stone or marble in marble. You can see that here on the uh, what's left, the portico of that temple. But now let's go to the temple, the Vestal Virgins. I forgot about this one, where 15 Vestal Virgins, there's even a song. Procol Harum, isn't that the group? I can never remember. <laughs> From the 60s, yeah. right? Pretty popular song, been a lot of movie soundtracks. Fire, shade of yeah, that, that's based on this legend, which is not a legend. There really were 15 virgins chosen by the emperor or sometimes his wife or someone else in his family to spend, I don't think it was an honor, but it was supposed to be, but what, not an honor most people would want, but you had no choice if the emperor said, you've been chosen, you went to live for the rest of your life, in essence, a very small enclosed area that today we'd call a kind of a monastery because you were religious figures who kept the eternal flame burning for the entire city of Rome for centuries, that flame never burned out. And then it burned out one night in, you have to know when, but I'll tell you, it was 410 when Attila the Hun was attacking Rome. And that's the first time Rome itself was uh, breached. The walls were breached by an invader. Um, so maybe it isn't a coincidence that keeping the flame was symbolic of protecting the city. So that was the job of these Vestal Virgins. They were usually in their mid to late teens and had to spend the rest of their life. Now they got fancy clothes, all the food they could eat, gold, silver, jewelry. They got to parade several times, more than once or twice a year, probably once a month or so during religious uh, ceremonies. But they were in essence kept in this confines. And, and that's all that's left of the temple of the Vestal Virgins. But this is nearly intact. In fact, it would be, it is actually, except for the pediment. But that was replaced by the Catholic Church in the first year the pilgrims had landed. You don't have to know any of this. 1620, that gives, uh, I think some of us will, some of you guys will get perspective. This reconstructed section where my arrow is, is a Catholic church that is as old as the entire East Coast colonies of you know, 400 years old. And that was replacing the old marble facade that once was there. And that's when they took down the pediment. But otherwise, minus the pediment, which is artificially removed, not, you know, didn't fall down. It's intact. The columns, let's go up close. You see that? And then uh, let's, we'll take another view of it. And who was it dedicated to? The uh, deceased wife of Marcus Aurelius. She died in about 175, in fact. So he lived the last several years of his life as a widower and never remarried. He could have remarried any eligible woman of age, you know, in, in, in the whole empire, but he chose not to. He really did love her. And they had been, I think, ch you know, childhood sweethearts or something. And a long time they'd been happily uh, involved first and then married. And um, that's one of those rare cases where they actually stayed happily married throughout his reign. So these columns are massive. They're about 45 feet tall. And they are Roman, they call it Roman style. You don't have to know that for example. But uh, this is that beginning of the road, Roman road system. And here it's even more clear. You can see the stairs, of, uh, they stole some of the marble later during the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. A lot of, not just the popes and the Catholic officials did that, though they did a lot of that, but some of the citizens of Rome to build their own houses and things. But look at that, that's a 2,500. The roads in Rome go back well before the Forum itself or the buildings in the Forum now, which are mostly 2,000 years old. 
Rome was founded in 753 BC. That's why it's called the Eternal City. It's nearly 2,800 years old. There aren't many cities in the world that old. And then, of course, if you go up close, look at how worn down by, you know, first, of course, chariot wheels, then vehicles, and now no cars are allowed here anymore, human feet. But my favorite thing in this part of the forum, and then we'll go to the Coliseum, is her. There she is. That's his now goddess, his deceased wife. Marcus Aurelius's wife was a dancer. And so here she is dancing in, they believed in a form of heaven, life after death. They call it the Elysian Fields. If you saw the movie, The Gladiator, it's a great movie. Really accurate about everything except how Marcus Aurelius died. Uh, everything else about it is pretty, including Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal of Co Commodus, who was one of the most corrupt and brutal of all the Roman emperors. But his father wasn't. <laughs> and so this was his deceased wife up in heaven, their version of heaven, and the temple's dedicated to her. Okay, so we already covered this, right? We covered that, but we didn't cover this, which is the uh, Arch of, keep it brief, the Arch of Titus. So, no, that was the last one. <laughs> Sorry, the Arch of Septimus Severus. You've heard the word to be severe. That's where this word comes from. This guy was severe to the extreme. He had secret police all over the empire, and he had tens of thousands of his political enemies executed. And the proof of it is right here on this. Look at that. These are his soldiers or his secret police, uh, you know, arresting people and or putting down, you know, some of them imaginary rebellions. But he was hated. So probably there were several real plots against him. He's the only emperor in the third century, which is the low point of the empire before it collapsed. Of course, it had a revival later. We'll get to that after the uh, midterm. There was a the last period of Roman uh, you know, growth and, and expansion again later, but during the 200s, third century, after Marcus Aurelius, uh, the empire was in decline. And mostly because the emperors never lasted more than two or three years, they were assassinated left and right. I mean, this guy's one of the few to survive. He actually was emperor for almost 20 years because of his reign of terror. He, he uh, managed to get ahead of his uh, enemies. Now we're gonna cover this uh, after the, the uh, midterm. So I'm not gonna go into it too much, except that look at these views of it. That's better than ones I think in the Stockstead files that I have um, for next week. This is the Arch of Constantine, the first Christian Roman emperor. I'm not gonna go into who he was. We'll cover that next week. But look how detailed it is. It's incredible. It shows his victories over some of his enemies and allowing them to go home in peace with their weapons and keep their land and their horses. Very unusual in the ancient world because he, quote, said God told him to do that. He was the first Christian emperor. And therefore, he said that the mercy he exercised against his enemies was what he was taught to do by reading, I guess, the Bible, or in any case, supposedly because he was Christian. Here are Roman soldiers, as you can see, and victory angels. It's a really incredible monument. But now let's go up to the Colosseum. Anybody um, ever goes to Rome and sees buildings with scaffolding, I think every one of you would know what the scaffolding's there for. Anybody? What would that be used for? Maybe cleaning? Yeah, exactly. Cleaning, exactly because they have to clean things. I mean, look, it's in the middle of a traffic circle. So of course it gets lots of pollution. But I, I did want to tell you this, well, I'm sorry. If anybody's from Teaneck, New Jersey, oh, I just skipped this view. I forgot I had this close up. Uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, I have friends there. And uh, my apologies to any one of you who live in that part of New Jersey or have family or friends from there. It's not a diss, it's just a fact. There was a tour bus from, it was Mark, Teaneck, New Jersey, senior citizen, something, something, whatever club. And as two of the, the uh, tourists were getting out, one of them looked up at the scaffolding while I was taking this picture. Well, it was actually before I took the picture, the bus had already left. And I heard them say, one of them said, Margaret, what's that scaffolding doing there? And the other one said, I don't know, Ethel, unless, oh, I think I know. That's what's been holding it up all these years. Oh, my God. <laughs> Unclear on the concept. Wow. <laughs> it's kind of sad, isn't it? Anyway, let's go inside it because I wanted you to see what it looked like when you walk into it. It's, it's just mind bending. And you can see that there's, of course, oh, a little bit here missing, but it's pretty well intact in the two thirds. It wasn't catabolized by the Catholic Church. Otherwise, it'd be completely intact. Uh, the scaffolding is, of course, not part of the structural support system. It's the engineering. Look at these rows of arches, each one 40 feet tall and uh, a total height of 160 feet. 
and then a few pieces of uh, marble that were pried loose have left chisel marks. But the one section here that I think is really important to mention, because my father was a World War II veteran, so I don't know if any of you have family members, maybe a few of you, grandparents, or who knows what generation they'd be now to you, some of you. I think this is something we don't always re remember or shouldn't take for granted. When the Allies, mostly Americans and some Brits, liberated Rome from the Nazis, they wouldn't surrender right away. So a group of them hid out in the Colosseum. You can check this out. It was a couple hundred. It was, it was more than a handful. And they start shooting snipers assaults on the people in the streets. And of course, the Americans are trying to, you know, kind of keep the city functioning while they were, you know, moving through on their way out to fight the other Germans further north. So they had to handle that. And they had two choices. Bomb the Colosseum and get rid of those they were SS, you know, the kind that wouldn't surrender no matter what, right? So they knew they, they couldn't get them to surrender. So they either could have bombed the Coliseum and destroyed a, a unique, irreplaceable work of history, or they could send in their own men, hand-to-hand -hand combat, which they did, and a bunch of the Americans died, liberating this building after the fall of Rome to the Americans. And so some of these are bullet holes, some of them, these from uh, the, the firefight, last a couple of days before they cleaned out the Nazis or at least a whole day. It wasn't something they could just march in and that was it. So I think that's kind of a, an important point to remember. Um, America's done some good in the world. We don't often hear that anymore, but we've done some good over the last couple centuries. Well, at least the last century, let's put it that way. Okay, let's walk underneath these arches and see what, look at this, it's 75,000 people. I, I'm convinced that's the actual capacity because up here were wooden bleachers. This is what they would today call the bleacher seats, of course, at the Oakland Coliseum, if you've been there. Um, and this is where the poor people sat. And then there were wooden, regular wooden seats down here. And then these are the marble seats for the senators and uh, the nobles. 75,000 people all cheering one way or the other, up or down, thumbs raised, thumbs down, right, for the gladiator at that moment who was obviously on the ground awaiting the call of the crowd as to whether they'd get mercy or death. I could hear the crowd when I was there. I don't know about other people. I don't believe there's something to that whole concept of reincarnation or whatever you want to call it, that some somehow there's something connecting us to the people in the past, and I don't think it's all ghosts. <laughs> This is where the gladiators hung out, hung out, sorry, where they were kept, I shouldn't have said hung out, where they had to wait their turn to go up into, because the floor is missing, but they're restoring it. Uh, the last person I talked to who's been there was, I think, just a year or two ago, and she said the floor is about, a, maybe a quarter of it has been restored. So this picture, when I took this picture, it's like over 35 years ago, the floor hadn't been any part of it restored. So then you'll see where the senators sat. One of these areas, the Rome, the emperor of Rome, would probably this section here with a very fancy, like a tent and servants and food and wine, of course, that is beck and call. Here's the column of Trajan. Now you can see how tall it is. And look, it hasn't never fallen down. It's the original column with the statue of one of the Catholic saints added much later, probably in the Renaissance. And you can see now here the base of it, right? Okay, now let's end up with the last must know, but this this is one of the uh, racetracks. There are several, several up on the hill above the city. This is one of the baths. The bathhouses in Rome were immense. They could hold some say up to 100,000 people at a time. And they had three temperatures, cold water for the poor, lukewarm water for the middle classes and warm water, of course, with you know servants attending for the wealthy, of course. This is the Circus Maximus. We saw it last week. If you recall, in the slide, it's a must know. Uh, and that was the one of the um, right uh, cityscape in Bosco Real, where that nobleman painted this in the background on the um, wall of his country villa. And that's when the columns were all standing. Now they're lying on the ground. But this held over 300,000 people. This isn't even half of it. But the outer walls, some parts of the outer walls still survive. Yeah, it's on that hill up above the forum. Okay, and that's the view from the hill. But now let's end up with the last must know. That's the tomb of Augustus. His body and all his wealthy belongings buried with him, you know, are long gone, of course. But this is the Arapakis. Okay, our last must know, and then we'll take a break. Arapakis, I'll spell that for you. 
and I'm not going to cut this from the study list. At least I, I don't plan to. I mean, it depends on how how we are when we get to the, you know, 40% is my is my promise to you of the total, and I will count during the break so I can, you know, start with the accurate number of slides that I'll need to reduce from the original list by at least 40%. Okay, so here we go. Ara is a two words. Ara A R A and then Pakis. P A C I S Ara Pakis, which means the Arch of Peace. Okay, location is Rome, and the date is nine B C or B C E. Okay, I'll go ahead and tell you guys. I did my uh, term paper. I think it was my bachelor's thesis. No, no, that wasn't for that. It was a thesis, though. Yeah, I think it was for my A A. Right, it would be right the two year degree. Uh, on this, on this structure, after my first visit to Rome, I was so fascinated with it that I decided I wanted to write a paper on it for one of my history classes because that was my major. <clears throat> so I can tell you with some authority what these figures uh, symbolize. But what is it? It's a, a large stone monument, not a victory uh, like triumphal uh, arch. It's not that kind of. It's not for military commemorating a military victory. It's commemorating the. 20th anniversary of Augustus becoming emperor. He actually became emperor in 30 BC, but it took a, you know, a year or so to make this. Then it was lost, buried underground for thousands of years or nearly 2000 years and found in the uh, mid 1900s, or I think it was the 30s. You could say that if you want, by Mussolini, not him personally. He didn't walk along on Sunday. Oh, I think, was he, not him personally, but his soldiers found it when they were digging tunnels for the subways in Rome. Of course, they have a subway system. Most big cities in Europe do. So while the subway tunnels are being dug, this monument was found nearly intact. It's only missing a few pieces in that one section. Otherwise, the whole thing is intact. And now there's the view. If it's on the exam, just so you know, this is the view you'd have to write about. What you see here are images of the first four Roman emperors. No other work of art in ancient Rome we have yet found has ever done that. And they're life-size images of a parade, you can call it parade, a procession is what the Romans would have called it, a procession in which Augustus and his whole family, that means him and his three successors that were going to become the next three emperors after he died, uh, are all participating, and, and also his wife. So let's identify them as we we do this one by one. There's Augustus. Whoops. Oh, stop. <laughs> he likes to jump around like that. Okay, let's do this. That's Augustus. He's probably the oldest man in that uh, procession or parade. And yet yeah, he was, you know, he was very tall and, and uh, healthy. Um, you know, he lived to be eight, over 80 years old. Back in the ancient world, that's a very long life. Okay. And then we have Livia his second wife. And she was the one, some historians believe, poisoned Augustus's own, oh, it's all part of the meaning now, poisoned Augustus's two biological sons. In any case, they died under mysterious circumstances in strange accidents while they were away from Rome. So could she have done something to arrange their deaths? No one can prove it. But if you want to hear the best uh, tip I can give you, if, if you're interested in this, very quickly for really understanding the family history the scandals behind the throne of the first four Roman emperors, you can't find a better series than I, as in the initial, not the body part. I, Claudius. It was a, a, a National Book Award? No, no, that's, it's British. So it was, a, yeah, it would have been a, a Pulitzer Prize, I think is what it won, as a series of novels or a long, I can't remember which it was, one long, long novel of over 1,200 words, or maybe it was several short ones about each of the first four Roman emperors and then the BBC can't do better than they do when it comes to history, created a series that became the most popular series on PBS. For years, it was running every year. People would watch it in parties. I used to have 20 friends over to watch, it's that good. It's called I, Claudius, based on the novels published in the 30s. And then the series was made, yeah, in the 70s, believe it or not, it's holds up. There's no, you know, you wouldn't notice how many years ago it was made because everything, the costumes, the sets, the, the history, the dialogue, and, and the intrigue is all accurate, very accurate, because the series is based on the books, 
were researched very carefully by a top British historian. So there we have, that's where the theories about uh, Livia, her name was. So Livia, Augustus' second wife, and then her son, Tiberius, right? And Tiberius was the second Roman emperor and he was a depressive. Some think manic depressive, but I don't know if there's a proof of that. So you could just say he had a, a depressive personality uh, and uh, he was uh, brutal, very brutal. Augustus wasn't, uh, he wasn't capricious. Now, I'd say he never executed anybody if he thought they were trying to overthrow him. Yes, he would, but he was not arrogant and he certainly didn't have a cruel streak. Tiberius was corrupt and brutal. Uh, if you watch that series, you'll see what I mean. It's pretty powerful. I mean, the actors are all top-notch Shakespearean quality actors. And you've seen some of them, like John Hurt, who played the next Roman emperor, Caligula, the little baby Caligula. Caligula, anybody know how corrupt he was? <laughs> he impregnated his own sister, not his cousin, his own biological sister. And then when she was eight months or several months pregnant, he started getting panicked that she would produce a superior being, a god that he must, because he thought he was a god. So if he procreated with his sister, then that child would have to be even more powerful god than he was. So he literally split her open by himself with a sword. He disemboweled his own sister. That's how sick this guy was. He was insane. And he's known as that way. Somebody, uh, was that you, uh, Rob? Somebody was going to say something. There have been movies about him, all kinds of movies. But in that series, you can't find a better portrayal of him. There have been dozens of actors that have portrayed him. I kind of, I find the movies kind of raw, like too much, personally. You, which one? Did you watch I, Claudius? Uh, oh, maybe no. you're talking about the Fellini movie. Yeah, that's a bit extreme. I couldn't watch it all the way through. I, I I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, no, it's much more in taste. They don't show all of the gore. They don't need to in the BBC series. It's much more effective just to get across the idea of how crazy he was. Guess who played okay. John Hurt, who won the Academy Award twice for Elephant Man. And uh, I forget what the other reason was. He played some, he's the guy that was the uh, first guy to die on the spaceship in Alien. The original movie, The Alien, I mean, you remember the guy that has a little alien pop out of his chest? That's John Hurt. John Hurt plays Caligula like no one else ever did. And they don't get unnecessary gore. And they don't need to. It's a classy, well done series. So I think you're talking about the movies, several different movies. Uh, there's one that was made in America, one in England, one in Italy. Uh, they they kind of, yeah, I, I, I think I understand your, your point. I mean, I, I don't want to watch, you know, nonstop gore. What's the point? No, the, the, the series I'm talking about, I, Claudius, is, is not like that. And then the last of the four emperors depicted is Claudius, who was another good emperor. So they went from a good one, Augustus, to a couple of cruel ones, one of whom was insane, back to back, you know, Tiberius and uh, um, Caligula, and then Claudius, who was a very enlightened man and a benign despot. He built housing for the poor and working classes. He expanded the harbor of Rome. He was one of their best emperors. And uh, he was, um, he had several birth defects. He, um, he had uh, polio when he was young, so he walked with a limp. He had a stutter. Um, a couple people maybe recently in American history, political history have stutters, right? One was just elected last year. Anyway, and then, then you had the fact that he had a hump, a humpback. So he was ridiculed. And when he was placed on the throne, it was meant to be a joke by the uh, guards. The guards of Caligua hated him so much, his own guards, that finally, after four years of suffering under him, they killed him and they all took turns stabbing him to make sure he was dead. Uh, and then they announced that they were going to declare Claudius. They thought they could make a puppet out of him. Oops, didn't work. He was too smart and too, too powerful and too clever. So he became one of their best emperors. So there you have the first four Roman emperors. It's a pretty amazing work of art, isn't it? Okay, that's plenty on the meeting. Let's wrap it up and then we'll take our break. We should end just about where the break should be at eight o'clock. Okay, this is a, a warm yellow color. So well, let's back up and see. Uh, these, these, of course, are my own slides. Well, here it looks cool gray. But I've stood in front of it, so it has, I think you can see, somewhat of a yellowish or light yellow. So I would accept either. You could say it looks more cool to you than, than, than warm, but it has a, a, a little bit of the yellow color of marble that's like the kind of marble used on the Parthenon, not the Pantheon, right? The one in, in uh, Athens. 
that I showed you. I think I told you that before, right? Where the Greek slice. Mm -hmm. There is such a thing as yellow marble. It's not very common. It's kind of rare. So this actually is a warm color. And that see me that texture. Wow, is it good? Of course, it had the best sculptors. It wasn't only one sculptor that worked on this. It had to be several. And the carved line is what creates the uh, similar textures on the clothing, the faces, the hair. Of course, all the bodies have rhythm with the arms, hands, legs, heads. Uh, for space, these are life-size images. Each one of these is portrayed as their actual life size. So only one person was taller than Augustus, this guy here. He's one of his generals probably, or maybe a nephew or something. In any case, he, he was tall, he was six feet. Uh, so there is only overlapping for space, no other technique here. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, stable, boy, it, there's nothing dynamic about it, except the bottom of their robes and the tops of their heads. So there's some minor or minimal dynamic detail. But overall, these are all upright figures walking in a procession that would have lasted hours throughout the, the, the center of Rome, what they were doing. They did that every year. But this is the big first really, you know, 20 year anniversary is a big deal for, of course, any <laughs> ruler. All right, and then we have, let's see, modeling. Of course, it's the shadows from the sun that create this image or we couldn't see it. So there's very strong modeling on here. It's all natural sunlight, shadows from the sunlight. Um, the largest mass, well, probably Augustus, but not by much because um, Tiberius is, is behind. See, this guy's too young. I used to think that was Tiberius, but no, he's too young to be Tiberius. So we can't see much of him, but it's a, it's a close call. But maybe first him and then uh, this other Roman, probably a senator, it's hard to say, this other uh, second largest figure would be next to Livia, and then she'd be, I guess, third, or she and her, I don't know, that would probably be her uh, sister. Anyway, another family member. Th these are all people related by marriage or birth to Augustus in this section of it. Okay, uh, am I missing anything? I think that's it. Uh, let's see, color, balance, did I say it's balanced? Yeah, if you draw the line down the middle, in this section, Livia would be dead center. And there's an equal number of figures on either side. So it's definitely balanced. Uh, okay, let's take a, a 20 minute break and then we will do, we'll end a little early, but we're not gonna rush. We'll take our time to go through how the test is going to be given, how it's uh, graded, how to study for it and reduce the study list by uh, over a third, let's say at least uh, whatever I put in writing, I think it's 40%. Uh, I will, yeah, 40% of the total list. So see you guys in about uh, 18 or 19 minutes. Let's say 820, I'll count people. Don't, don't go away, you wanna see the review. It'll help you all with the, the midterm. Okay, pause, pause here. Okay, this should be recording. I think you guys can tell, right? Because I don't want to assume that it is. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to get it. We have to maneuver away from this. Uh oh, okay, screen sharing stopped, but the recording is still, right? <laughs> right, you guys can, I hope, see the recorded, uh, or he see that it is recording, correct? Anybody? It is recording. Good, because those who aren't here tonight or at, for some reason uh, to bow out early, they're really going to want to watch this recording because otherwise they'll waste time studying slides that won't be on the uh, midterm. Okay, but I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, make a minor correction. It's it's not It won't affect in case the RAPOC is, is on the midterm. Uh, I kind of thought of this right at the start of the break. I remember thinking, wait a minute, Caligula was the youngest, one of the youngest Roman emperors. So because if this was 9 AD, the youngest child in that procession could have been him, but it was 9 BC. So he wasn't born yet. So Caligula is not depicted. Three of the first four Roman emperors are in the Arapakis, which I just showed right before the break as the last new must know slide before the midterm. Augustus, Tiberius and Claudius. And uh, Caligula came along a little later. He was in his 20s, I think, when he uh, took the throne and only survived four. It's amazing. He survived four years as cruel and as hated as he was by his own bodyguards. And they're the ones that killed him. So all the facts I told you are right, except that the Caligula is not in that. Oh, yeah. And I also double checked about the film version of 
think we're talking about the one that was made by Penthouse Magazine. Of course, that's <laughs> over the top. It's more graphic in way more ways than than uh, just you know the violence. It was meant to be offensive. Literally, that film was intended to be offensive. So I've never watched that. I think I one time accidentally was going to try to see if it had any redeeming. But this is not what I was talking about. In case you're curious, I Claudius is a first rate, well written historically accurate and beautifully filmed and acted uh, account of the first four Roman emperors uh, private lives. Okay, <clears throat> including Caligula. All right, but now we are focusing on the review. So here's the first thing. I've mentioned this before um, with the papers, but let's do this now and I'll hold this up and leave it up for a little while. This is how you need to submit <laughs> your um, papers uh your papers your, your midterm obviously this class is right oops <laughs> 2.1 my mind is on uh as my dad used to say guacamole dip i'm crossing off the one i already crossed it out once but i'll do it again sorry about that let's do that over okay obviously this is our 2.1 the other class the 1.2 has already had their midterm Okay, our 2.1 midterm, underline, last name, comma, first name, and then it needs to go to, as a PDF only, or I won't be able to open it, let alone grade it, to me at my AOL. Um, and please, if you're using, we covered this, uh, you know, at the start of this evening's lecture, but if you're using some kind of email handle that doesn't jive with your name or have even part of your name in it, um, if there's anything you can do or someone else's email, I might or might not be able to know who it is that sent that particular test, uh, you know, PDF file in to me. So to avoid that problem, if you can possibly, or or else in the description, at least put your, um, of course, you're going to have this. This will probably be what I'll see. But if there's room to write your name, as in your correct name, as you were enrolled in the class, first and last name and in the handle that would be helpful that's only if you aren't using an email that um has you know part of your name in it or that is associated with your first paper because i already have those all those stored okay um and it will need to be by midnight on the night of the exam i'm already giving you a, a extra break if you call want to call it that extra time uh, more than I can possibly give the in-person class, but I'm teaching two sections of R2.1. And to be fair, that class I will allow to turn in their exams by the end of the evening, which is already more than, it's double time. The test is a one hour exam. Most of you will finish it probably with time to spare, but the slides are gonna be only on the screen during the test itself, the real time test. Otherwise, it's not a fair, equal playing field because I'm giving you guys till midnight, partly because you are going to have to, some of you will choose, you don't have to, but you might choose to convert a hand printed set of answers if that's how you want to, to, to write your answers right on the exam, which you're going to get. There's a lot to cover here. You're going to get that as a document from me on, um, let's over the weekend. And it will look like this when you print it out. Obviously, this is for the final, so I'm not going to show you any of the questions on it because you already have an advantage. Everyone does it, both the in-person and this uh, Zoom version of this same class in that it is an open book, open note test for everybody. OK, but you are going to have three sections of the uh, test itself. And one will be to identify five slides, just like this right here, the way they were on the syllabus, exactly the same as what the syllabus had to say. And then there will be a true false section. I'm not gonna show you that because that would give away what's coming up on the final with five of the definitions that I gave you where there's something about that sentence that's either completely correct, that definition as I restate it from the notes you, you already have from all the terms, the list of terms, you know or some of them will be false because part of the definition won't be correct, will be false. So that's the true false section. There are five of those 
And then the most uh, important, well, I'd say the most time consuming part, the part that'll take you the longest is the third part in which you I, uh, identify the, the three last three must know slides from the syllabus, three of the slides, I'm sorry, from the syllabus. And I, I picked them at random and I, of course I changed them around from one semester to another, obviously. So you'll have three slides with each one on the screen for 15 minutes. That's plenty of time to at least identify them and start writing the meaning and the formal analysis. On the meaning, your requirement, if you want full credit, is six sentences, six facts. I gave you was way more than that on each of the slides when we talked about the meaning of every must know slide. So when you see a slide and you identify it from the syllabus for the slide analysis or slide essay part, the last three slides will be their short essays of two paragraphs. Please keep them separately and don't do bullets. Bullets is not an essay, that's an outline. These are full sentences and paragraphs, short paragraphs, six sentences on the meaning, six facts from all the notes I gave you for that slide. And then the second paragraph, you can do it either, you can do the formal analysis first, it doesn't matter what the order is, but keep them separate. And the other paragraph would be six of the nine elements. You don't have to do all nine like you did on your paper, you just do six of the nine elements that you see and that you can easily identify. And don't forget, you don't get more than half credit. That won't give you a good grade. If all you do is say, this is a dynamic work of art because of all the diagonal lines, eh. <laughs> where it, at least give me two examples, just like you did on your papers, as, as most of you now have uh, done your papers. And as I told you how to write your papers. So that would be six of the nine elements and you can do that in a sentence. You can provide two examples of say modeling or uh, cool, warm and cool colors and where they are in, in just a single sentence. So that will end up being a second paragraph of at, at least six. If you wanna get extra thorough, you could do more than six of the nine elements and you could do more than six facts about the meaning in that paragraph. But that's the requirement that would give you full credit if you do a thorough job. So the grading of it, is going to be 15 points. I'll hold it up again and, and leave it up for a moment for you to look at or go back and look at when you watch, if you choose to watch this video on YouTube after 7 p.m. on Friday, uh, or just take a screenshot if you prefer. Uh, those slides will be on the screen for two minutes. Believe me, that's more than enough time. A lot of you are gonna be whistling, tapping your fingers. I know I've seen it happen. Bored waiting for the next slide. But I give you up to two minutes because some people, you know, will take more time than others. For each of these three slides, five, I'm sorry, five slides. So you can do the math, it's right there, right in front of you, but I'll summarize it. Each fact you get correct from each of those five slide identifications is worth three points. So three times three is nine. And of course, nine times five, five slides is 45 points. So in the first uh, 10 minutes, that's why you have to be on time for this. I will show the first slide at 6.45, gives you a little extra time, you know, to log in in case you're just getting home from work or something. So you do want to be logged in by 6.40 at the very latest so that you get to see the first slide and then not miss points because I can't go back. The slide has, has, I mean, the exam can only go forward uh, in real time. So once again, to summarize the first five slides, each one, if you get them all correct, the date, the title and the artist or location. You know, in some slides, we don't know the artist, if whatever's on the syllabus. If we only gave the location, that's all you need to write. Is nine points times five is 45. There's almost half the total of 100 points uh, before we get to the true false. They're worth two points each. So that's the second section. There goes 10 more points. And then you can probably guess for each of the three slide analysis, you're going to get. If you do them full and thorough job correctly for each slide will be worth a total of 15 points for each correct answer on the slide essay part. And three times 15 is 45. I've spent years uh, developing this. It's not, this is not Sarah Gill's system. She had a much more cumbersome system of grading that required scantrons and uh, you had to weigh one slide against another and do, do double analysis. It was a lot more work. And those were two hour, hour and a half exams. I try to keep mine pretty straightforward. So what you're gonna have is 
45 points on slide notifications if you get them all right, 10 points on the true false if you get them all right, and another 45 points, 15 points for each of the correct answers on the three slide essays. But wait, there's more. It's optional. There will be an extra credit slide. You can just ignore it and sign off if you want, or you know, whatever, segue away from the screen and start looking over your answers to double check you got thorough, correct answers. You'll have until midnight to submit it, but I have to cut things off that. It's not fair to those who could, who turn them in on time, or as I said, to the in-person class who only have, what, two hours, I guess it is, or maybe two and a half, if, yeah, we end at 9.30 um, total for them to get their tests done. You can go back and revise your answers, in other words, or re format them into a Word document, because I don't care if you send me the PDF as a um, screenshot, as long as in PDF format, now I can read your writing. If, if you've been told you have the neatest cursive in the world, uh, don't, don't trust that teacher <laughs> back in grade school or, or middle school. Please print your answers if you're using hand printed, you know, method to, to write right on this sheet. The other choice is to convert this into a document. You'll have it well over 24 hours before the test starts into a Word doc of some kind or some kind of you know, digital document. And then of course you can fill in electronically your answers. And then you'll have until midnight to double check them, go back, maybe correct or add to whatever uh, you think you need to do and make sure they're submitted before midnight on the night of the test. Okay, so that's how the test is given. Oh, I didn't say the extra credit is worth five points and it'll be a slide of a real scene from real life that I took and there'll be no analysis. You'll get no credit for that. You already will have done plenty of uh, formal analysis. It'll be no facts, no dates, no, it'll just be fun. It'll be make up a story. You've all been asked to do that somewhere in your school schooling. You know, five sentences of a story you make up after you hear the facts, the real facts. So who is that or what is that scene? Where was it taken? What was happening? Then you could ignore those facts or you can work them into your own short story. Five sentences, that's pretty short. If you want five extra credit points, give me three sentences, you get three points extra credit. I've seen people miss an A in the class by five points and it'll be the same thing on the final. So that's a total of uh, 10 extra credit points on the two exams. If they don't do the extra credit on one or both tests, miss the, the A they could have had by that many points. I recommend you do it, but it's not required. Uh, so that would be up to 105. Some people will get 105 points on the midterm. Okay, I'm going to pause because that's a lot all at once. It'll be even clearer when you get this, but I've already helped. See, here's the room you can use to write if you're hand printing your answers, at least the first version before you convert something if you just do it into it. Well, you have to convert it to a PDF before sending it or I can't open it. So that's room enough to write two paragraphs, but you can use the back side or an extra page. And so I will send you this document which will have one, two, three pages. And the third page will be room enough, if you choose to write right on here, to, to uh, fit in the answer for the third slide essay. If you want to write extra long answers because you're going to convert it into some kind of a, a Word doc before you then put that into PDF format, uh, that's fine. If you but. You, you probably don't want to waste time and spend you know more than the minimum necessary for each of those uh, slide essays. Um, so it's it's a mix of yeah some facts, but you've got them in front of you with the syllabus since it's an open uh, book, open note test, and then some slide analysis, the kind that you did on your papers. Okay, so before we proceed with cutting down the list of both the slides from the syllabus to reduce it by at least 40%. And that'll take us a little while because I, I don't just do it like immediately. I look down each list and think which slides are so important that I told you guys I wasn't gonna cut them and which ones are not in that category can I afford to cut without you know, hitting or cutting out the heart and bone of this, uh, of this course. Uh, that'll take a few minutes, more than a few minutes. And then we'll do the same with the um, list of terms to know after we do the uh, reduction of 40% or more on the uh, syllabus slides. Okay, but first, any questions about anything I just said relating to the format of the test? Yes. Sure, go ahead. Um, my question is, I, I assume you're gonna be sending it to us in PDF form? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean- I, I have do, to, I have no choice, it's not no, my- I get that. I just, I've never converted PDF to Word, so can I just 
can we rewrite it in word? Yeah, it verbatim and yeah just, that's a good, you know, good point. You're right. That, that's a good thing to clarify. Whatever works for you, the only bottom line, it's not my rule. This is the, the entire JC's rule for all classes that are using remote teaching methods. Okay. That PDFs, well, actually, even in-person classes where I did that with that class I teach on Wednesday night up in Santa Rosa, if they are going to, I have to send you any document I send to all my classes by PDF. So it's the most accessible, at least according to the tech people. That's what they tell us. And the college has set that rule. It's not my you know, right. department. And then, so yes, you could do that. Sure. If you want to convert something, you know, into one format and then back to PDF or take a screenshot and then turn that into a doc and then turn that on PDF. You'll have until midnight, so you'll have some time. You know, right. you want to give yourself, uh, the, I know some of you have families, right? I do. Right? And so you want to give yourself some leeway in the evening hours between when the exam ends, the slide portion of it, you can still work on it after the class is over that night. That's one week from tonight. Remember, first slide on the screen at 6.45, and then at 8 p.m., I will pause after you've had a chance to see all the slides, including the extra credit, and you can keep working if you want during the break, but then you want to put your pens away temporarily and take notes on the new slides because we, we have a lot to cover after the midterm. And that starts right away, right after the break on Monday with slides of early Christian art, I think, and then the following week it's Islamic art. And at least one of each of the next two lectures, the second half of next week, and the one on Islamic art a week from, so two weeks from tonight, at least one of each of those lectures will definitely be on the final. And it'll be the exact same format. The final will be exactly the same format. And it's not cumulative, you remember. It's, you'll have to go back and study all the stuff in the mid -term. Okay, good good point to raise. I hope that clarifies. And any other questions, now is a good time to ask about the format. Of one last question is, um, uh, what is the exact day that you're gonna be sending this uh, document to us? I don't know if I heard that or not. Well, I don't really want to give it to you so early. Well, actually, no, there's no downside to that. I was going to wait till Sunday evening, but I'll be uh, probably with my family going to a pumpkin patch on Sunday because that's my daughter's favorite thing. Her favorite holiday is Halloween, and we can only do it this Sunday for various reasons. So I'm trying to decide if I get back late. Well, let me ask you this, uh, in deference to everybody. Um, how many of you stop checking your email on Sunday after, say, 5 p.m. or 6, let's say 6? Because I, I think we don't. don't. But I mean, look, I, I probably don't. But I, what I'm wondering is it doesn't seem like there's really any information on that is going to give us. An well, edge. there is the true false questions. OK, well, maybe maybe you just send the stuff that's not. No, I can't break it up. It's all in <laughs> one PDF. You can't edit once PDF. Okay stored and that's how i have these is stored i can completely alter the entire text but i'm not going to have time to do that right. you know or recreate it i mean and then add new but the true false questions i i kind of think on the other hand you'll you know you'll have to read them carefully and some people will miss them regardless even though it's an open book test so maybe that's not a downside let me ask again is it is anybody listening now uh, busy enough on Sunday evenings. I know it's family time. It's a weekend where after five or certainly after six, you wouldn't be able to check. Of course, you could do that on Monday morning, but you, you might have jobs. I understand that or other classes that you're busy with or getting kids off to school. Um, <clears throat> is that a personally work? Thing? I personally work two jobs to where it's a little bit of a struggle, but if it's not a problem for everyone else, I could always make it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's a legitimate concern. Then the only other thing I can think of is doing it Sunday before I leave for, uh, we're going down to the peninsula. I think, is, does anybody know? No. It's funny, it will be recorded. Is the Half Moon Bay Pumpkin Festival canceled like it was last year? It was canceled last year. I think it is. I don't want it. We're not going there, but that creates traffic. If you know what that's like on Hall the Halloween season, we'll call it, within at least two weeks. Obviously, Sunday will be two weeks exactly before Halloween. Um, anybody know? Is the Pumpkin Festival in Half Moon Bay still, is it happening again? If it no is, clue. I know I won't get back by five then. Not even close. Probably 6.30 or 7.00. And that's kind of late, I think, for some people, because Sunday evening, you might just not want to have to check your email. 
So I'll probably send it uh, Sunday morning before noon. Yeah, I can I can make that commitment or by noon, let's say. So you should be able to check sometime Sunday between noon and dinner. Yeah, and I have I have one more question about the slides. Yeah, sure. Because there are a lot. And so my original plan was to just pull all of these up and just attach names. No, 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 no. That's what you're gonna now you're gonna benefit from this part of the review. Okay, you're gonna tell us I'm gonna cut that list very significantly. Good. I said in writing, I promise it, and I put it in writing 40% at least. But before we get to that part of the process, because now is a chance for you to ask any questions that aren't already clear or about something I haven't thought to address here so far regarding the format of the test, the, uh, the way it's gonna be uh, given. So in other words, you'll see the PDF of the test uh, no later than midday Sunday, probably even earlier, you know, like 11 or something. I do tend to sleep in one day a week and that's usually Sunday, okay. Uh, uh oh, you're saying your network is so, I'm sorry. There's no school app that I use because I don't, you know, do anything other than the direct PDF format to you. And then this, I mean, if you're looking at this, you must be getting uh, by now, nine weeks into it, I haven't had anybody say anything different. And I, of course, can't control what equipment each person has to receive the Zoom lectures. But you're with us now, right? That per I didn't see who that person was. Uh, sorry, I'm looking to see if they're up there. Uh, all I can say is that it will be broadcast in real time. And it will be something you'll need to then, you know, watch the slides and take the notes from them and, and at least identify each one during the, the, the uh, test period. And then I'm signing off at eight, I'm not putting it on YouTube. I already explained that and why. It's very specific, and I've done that already with uh, with a much much bigger class. However, reception is an issue. That uh, let's put it this way: if there's something you have no control over, your own equipment. I don't know what else to say, but that's something you should be able to have control over for any college level courses you take. But if it's something like a power outage, of course. Uh, you know, uh, that wouldn't be, it's an act of nature or God or whatever. Then there'd be a, some form of makeup. I would figure that, but it wouldn't be the same test. It would be something equally, or if not more, perhaps time consuming, uh, but I'd have to give that some thought. Uh, that didn't happen yet. Knock on wood. Here's the third Zoom semester. I call them Zoom semesters of remote learning. And so far, no one has had that issue, but, but you know, I know the power's out for several people in the North Bay because I got an email today from someone who said he can't attend tonight's class, but he can watch the review, uh, the replay of this, of course, on YouTube uh, on the weekend. So I don't know what else to tell the person who just uh, sent a question, except that it, it's just gonna be the way this is now, exactly what you know, you're hearing and seeing now. So maybe you can go to a friend's house or borrow someone's you know, laptop or computer with better whatever, visual and sound. That'd be about all I can think of to hopefully be helpful. I understand, you know, the situation in some ways. I never was going to buy a laptop ever because my photographer who does all the photos for all the books I've had, the three books I've had printed in hard copy on architecture, they're all still in print on different architects. Um, <laughs> His daughter in high school was doing a project and asked to borrow his laptop, which had all the photos from months of our travels all over the West Coast of different historic buildings for this book that we had a contract and a deadline coming up. She dropped it walking across his living room and he lost a whole bunch of his slides. So I never trusted laptops, but you know, we have no other realistic choice now with the Zoom process. So I made sure I got a laptop that had, you know, the basic functions. I, I, we've been lucky, knock on wood again, to not have service interruptions, but I'll bet before December, by the end of this semester, there'll be storms. I mean, let's hope there's some rain coming. And there might be nights where, you know, I'll have to modify the lecture, the number of slides I give because there's interruptions and I have to reconnect. That's happened at least twice in the last 18 months. But that's beyond the control of any of us. When it comes to equipment and receptions at your end, um, I don't know what else to say, but just see if you can get to a computer which has a reliable 
set of functions and that you can hear and see everything because you will need to do that to see the slides and, and hear. There won't be any uh, narration, <laughs> right? I will say before each section how long you have for that slide and give you guys a heads up on the slide essays because that's a 15 minute window. I'll say two minutes left on this and then maybe 30 seconds to give you a little heads up. But of course, if you don't finish them, and yet you surely you can identify slides within that time frame while they're on the screen, uh, your laptop. Uh, then you can go back, of course, and fill in the answers the way we just described. Uh, as well, I guess was Rob was saying, you could, you could do it however you want. You could do yeah, neat or or you know rough hand printed version and then translate that into a type document, uh, or you can do the whole thing hand printed if you print neatly and uh, use that as is whatever the source for a screenshot and turn that into a PDF. As long as you send it to me as a PDF on a Mark W AOL by midnight. Well, this is the right time to ask questions. So any other questions about what we've just discussed, which is the format of uh, and the basic requirements of the midterm? Anybody else? Before we do the slide reduction exercise and reduce the list of terms to know. Anybody? OK, hang on. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, well, I just said the first part is slide identification. I already held it up, but I'll do it again. <laughs> is the first five slides you identify just like they were on the syllabus. And you'll have two minutes for each one of those. That'll be more than enough time if you've studied. And again, you won't have as many to, to look at from your notes because we're just about to reduce that list by 40%. And then there'll be the true false. I'm not gonna hold that up because then you'll see what those questions are before I send them to you. Then the third part is the slide analysis, where you do a uh, you know short essay of two paragraphs. I've already covered this, or unless you just joined us, but I don't think anyone joined us after the break, as I recall, right? And then those are two paragraphs, of course, uh, on each of the three slide essays. One on the formal elements, six or more of the elements out of the nine that you can that you've written by. You only have to identify six to get full credit in six sentences, and six facts about the meaning from all the notes I gave you on those must know slides under meaning. So two short paragraphs, separate, one on meaning, one on form analysis, after you identify each of those three slides, and you'll have 15 minutes on each of those three slides. So that's the, the whole format, except oh, the extra credit one, that, that'll be on the screen until eight. Uh, and that's optional, you don't have to do it. You can go back and work on the earlier questions, or you can sign off and have a longer break. Okay, I think I've covered the main points about the format, but anybody else have a question I didn't already answer? Okay, and of course I'll stick around at the end for any follow-up questions. And those could be about anything, extra credits, your, your grades or whatever. Again, I won't tell anybody, anyone else's grade or anybody's grade over this medium because it would be giving away confidential information. Okay, so let us go back now flipping back through the pages of time Here we go. <laughs> to remember what we're going to do now is cut this list down by 40 percent and we're going to do it together as a group and i will then repeat at the end of that part of this process when we've done the slide reductions those slides you should have crossed off the list but how do i get to 40 percent well i could use a calculator or i can just remember and i'm pretty good at that what 40 percent of the total is but first, we have to count how many there were. I alter this list every semester a little, you know, add some, uh, subtract some. So let me do that. We can do it together. <clears throat> how many slides were there or are there now before the reduction, the 40% reduction? So here we go. Week one, one, two, four. Okay. And then, uh, so eight by week two. <coughs> and then nine, 10. Fifty-two. Fifty-two. Anybody else wanted? I should have asked if somebody wanted to count along with me, but anyway, it is fifty-two. I counted uh, slowly, and uh, that's about right because it's usually somewhere between forty-eight and fifty-six each semester. So right in the middle is what I chose this semester. So there were fifty-two slides. The point being on the original li syllabus list. 
What's 40% of 52? Well, it would be 20 plus, right? 20.8. It's 21 point something, isn't it? 20.8. Yeah. And I hate odd numbers, so you guys get a slight benefit. I'm going to make it 22. I'll cut 22 slides. And that will reduce the list to only 30 that you need to study instead of 52. That should help quite a bit. Okay, here we go. Let's do it together in order week by week. We'll start with week one. Well, this is going to be easy because we didn't, this course does not cover Renaissance or, or uh, 19th and 20th century art, but I showed you those slides as a starting point. Remember the first night we covered a lot of different types of art to define what is art. So we're going to cut three, in other words, bottom line, under week one, cut three of them. You, you take first this first slide, Libyan Civil. You should be doing this right now as we go uh, along together along with me. Okay, so the first slide, cross that off. Leave Leacon group, because that's an ancient Greek art, uh, work that might be on the exam. Okay, then cut the third one, Wheat Field and Cypress Trees by Van Gogh, and then Guggenheim Museum by Wright. So there's already three I've cut. Okay, then I'll repeat the list one more time before we move on to the reducing the uh, list of terms. Okay, let's go to week two. Cut bison. Okay, cut that one. Um, I'm not sure yet. I may or may not want to cut one more, but let's keep going. So we'll see how many we have when we get to the last week. So moving on to the second page, uh, which is uh, at the top of page two for week three. Okay, um, head of a ruler from Nineveh, cross that out. And then uh, dying lioness, cross that out. Okay, I know we're probably gonna have to go back and, and cut some more. Okay, week four. Um, this is harder because these are all really important, but I don't. Okay, Temple of Hachetsu, cross that out. And Pylon of Ramses II at Karnak. Okay, so that's two in the middle of the list from week five. Okay, week six, female figure from Cyclades, cross that out. Uh, beehive tomb at my scene. Yeah, we're on uh, week five or six. We're on week six. I'll repeat this list, of course, again before we uh, finish with this process. So that was two from week six. Female figure from Cyclades and beehive tomb at Mycenae. Okay, week seven. Next page. Quirrells from Athens. <clears throat> All right, um, and then we have Young Warrior from Riachi, Italy. And um, the Temple of Athena Nike for, by Callicrates, that's under week seven. Okay, week eight, Tomb of the Lionesses. I think I already told you to cut it, but if you didn't, you should now cross off the second one under week eight. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cross off Cityscape from Bosco Real and Porta. Yeah, I'm going to cross off Porta Augusta. This that is not the same, of course, as Augustus of Prima Porta, but the fourth one down under week eight, Porta Augusta, cross that off. All right, um, and then week nine. Equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. I think we're gonna have to go back and cut a couple more because I doubt we're at 22. And then, I'm sorry, on the previous page, week nine, I go ahead and cross off the column of Trajan because I only have a close-up of it. And that might be harder to know what it is. All right, let's see how many we have cut. I'm sure it's close to 20, but it's probably not 22. One, two, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight, nine. I got 15. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I've cut 18. I'm sorry, did somebody say 15? Because I I must I just have bad lines, I guess. 
Uh, well, I'm going to repeat them all, but it, it is 18. Yeah, I'm looking right at the list, but I will repeat the whole list so you know for sure. So we need to cut four more. So let's go to week two. A cross off woman from Bellendorf. That's actually misnamed anyway, or at least many stores think it is. So we still have to cut three more. Okay. Um, oh, under week four. I'm going to leave the, the Miwok roundhouse, but I'm going to cut Pomo ceremonial feather regalia. Okay. I don't think our class has had that lecture yet. You know what? Yeah. You're right. So that's an easy extra two, even though I am going to show you a couple, but we're not going to be tested on them, at least for the midterm. I may add them because I don't want to skip over that. It's an important topic. The local heritage from, of course, Miwok, meaning coastal tribes that were here. But you're right. I don't think we covered it. Uh, no, it's not. So, yeah, there we go. There's two more. Everyone hear this now? Week four, just for at least for the midterm, they may appear on the final, one of them maybe. But uh, for now, cross both of week four slides off as much as I uh, regret doing it. That's the Miwok Roundhouse and the Pomo Ceremonial Feather. Hey, you're on the wrong class, I think. We don't, we haven't, we haven't covered those at all. You're right. Well, why didn't you is guys this another test? test? Are you giving us why another? Why didn't you guys? <laughs> we haven't oh, it is the right. Wait a minute. No, you go, oh, you almost got me there. No, I we, teach we two of these horrendously the difficult back to back non-stop draining energy sucking zoom classes so you had me thinking i was reading from the syllabus for art 1.2 no this is the right syllabus no we, we haven't have had it yet theory. because that week right. we didn't have class on monday right. but we'll have it next you're week. right i totally uh, concede agree and concur you are right we didn't get to those because that will come up later for this class because this class did not meet on the Monday when I covered those in the in-person class. So we, you're right, but we I already were, crossed them We were off. in Persia. What's the confusion? We were in Persia on week all, Both of the slides of week four, just cross them off. Okay, so now we're at 21. Because I cut, crossed off one from Villendorf, it was at 18, that made it 19. So we got to cut one more. And then I will repeat the list and that should be good enough for everyone to uh, be 100% sure what is and isn't going to be on the exam. Okay. We were all in Iraq on week four on this one, or week three. Yeah, that's true, but I already cut. I'm trying to decide if I should cut one more from that list. Uh, I think those are that's down to a pretty much of a minimum from that culture. Okay, let's see. All right, uh, I guess I'll cut Nike Winged Victory from week seven. I hate doing that, but it's, you know, already cut the other Nike, but all right, I'm going to count again to make sure I have 22, because that's now over 40%. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. I will repeat the list now, everybody, if you want to double check, because there was some uncertainty there in uh, the middle area of week, when we were talking about week four. Each week, just double check that you have correctly crossed off the right slides, uh, one by one. Week one, there are three you cross off. The Libyan Sybil by Michelangelo, Wheat Field and Cypress Trees by Van Gogh, and the Guggenheim Museum by Wright, okay? Week two, you cut two. Woman from Willendorf, Austria, and Bison from France, okay? Week three, you cut two more. Head of a ruler from Nineveh and dying lioness from Iraq. Okay. Week four, because we didn't co co cover either of them. Um, so in a way, you guys are right to, to, to call me on the fact that that class, the in-person class, could be tested on these two. So I'll have to alter that. And I'm writing myself a note in the margin. That class, we covered these, but not yours. So both slides from week four, just cross them out. Miwok, Roundhouse, and Pomo ceremonial feather regalia. You'll see those slides later. We, I may just make them extra information because I know you don't want to go back and think about- We what don't have those. We don't have those. They're not on will. our list. You will. No, but we're talking about crossing up week four. 
Oh, okay. Oh, I got you. We didn't cover no, it. No, no. I'm sorry, Rob. I'm calling you on this one. That's why I'm, okay, I'm confused. Right. Right. Me accurately and helpfully, but this time I think you got a little confused. It's on the list, but you guys didn't see them. So 100% right. accurate okay. to say you can't be tested on them. I may show them after the midterm at some point when we get towards the last couple of weeks, because we usually have a little extra leeway left. In, but if we don't have time, then in any case, I won't test them. I've decided I'm not gonna test you guys on them because you know, they're on this syllabus in the period before the midterm and we couldn't see them. So you guys get a break. You, there's no way you're gonna be asked to study those. Everybody hear that now, week four, both slides, cross them off. Okay, moving on, week five, two more. Cross off Temple of Hatshetsu, Egypt, and Pylon of Ramses II at Karnak, okay? Week six, you're crossing off uh, two more female figure from Cyclades and beehive tomb at Mycenae. All right, moving on to week seven, you're crossing off four. Kuros from Athens, young warrior from Riachi, temple of Athena Nike by Callicrates and uh, Nike wing of victory by Samothrace. Uh, because it'd be easy to confuse those two. Right, because they're both of the same goddess, but they're very different uh, settings. Okay, week eight, crossing three off. Tomb of the Lioness from Tarquinia, uh, Porta Augusta from Perugia, and Cityscape from Bosco Real. And then week nine, you're crossing two more. Column of Trajan from Rome, and the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius from Rome. Okay, we got to our 40%, a little more actually, 22. So that, that reduces the list from 52 to 30 that you only need to review. And of course, would want to have the notes in front of you for those during the test. All right, let's do the same. It'll take a lot less time. Uh, and then I'll stick around with questions from the list of terms to know. Uh, hang on, I gotta pull that list <laughs> from <clears throat> this class, not the other one. Okay, here we go. Okay, list of terms to know from R2.1. How many are there? Well, I didn't say 40% here. Let's say at least a third. It's a short list to begin with compared to the syllabus, but I'll cut at least a third of them. So let's see what that would be. Um, okay, how many are there before we do the reduction? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 18, 19, 20, if you count the two lists, which they qualify as a single entry, right? You might be asked to name, you know, the, the things invented by ancient Egyptians include, let's say, uh, frescoes and uh, domes, true or false. You should all know that. They just False, <laughs> the Romans invented the domes, right? So that's how those will come up is what I'm saying on the true false section. But here we need to cut, well, what is uh, one third of 20 is seven at least, right? Did I have that right? <laughs> or 30%, 30% is six. So at least six, maybe seven. All right, let's do it together. Like we did the last uh, set of uh, slides that we cut, take the list of terms you should already have in front of you anyway and cross off as we go in chronological order, you know, the order they appeared in the lectures. First cross off Cherub on page one, and then Amulet, it's a fourth one down, and then Animal Style. It might still come up in one of the slides, you know, if I show a slide that shows animals doing human things, but uh, it's not gonna be on the uh, true false section of the midterm. Again, that's three slides, Cherub, Amulet and animal style. Moving on to page two, cross off obelisk, kuros, right? And uh, I'm going to give you a break on pediment. You should know portico, uh, but pediment, I'll give you a break. Now, okay, so that's three, and I'll repeat the list, of course. On the next page, um, necropolis. And I'm gonna leave the list of Roman things invented by the Romans, but I am going to cross off one of those items because I might ask you, you know, a two false question where I list three or four of the things, which if they're all correct, then that's a true item. Uh, but if one of them is not a thing invented by the Romans, it'd be false. I just give you an example. 
So I want to cross off number five within the list of things invented by Romans, interstate road system. Interstate road system. Um, I'm not leaving it on the list of things invented by Romans. Everybody understand that? Anybody have a question? Now, then I'll repeat the list. And then we will stick around. I'll stick around as long as you need me to to answer any questions you, you have that I didn't already about anything, not just the test. Okay, let's do it one more time together so everyone has the same exact list of slides remaining after they uh, reduce uh, those slides. Actually, how many is that? I reduced one, two, three. It's going to be at least six, seven, eight. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's seven. Technically, it's eight, but seven is more than a third of 20, right? Something like 35%. It's well over the what I've just promised you I would do. Okay, here we go. Now, the list of terms that you cross off. On page one, there are three. Cherub, amulet, and animal style. Okay, moving on to the second page. Cross off obelisk. Kuros and pediment. Okay. And then on the last page, there's actually two things you cross off necropolis, third page, right? Necropolis. And then just one of the items invented by the Romans. I won't put that into a true false question. And that will be number five interstate road system. Even though they did invent it, um, you know, the other five are more than enough for you to you know, possibly have a question about on the true false section. Okay, anybody have any questions now about those um, seven terms I just crossed off? Well, eight if you count removing the uh, interstate roads uh, item from the list of Romans inventions. Okay, so now I've reduced these two lists for you to study from by significant proportion. And of course you can have your textbook in front of you, you can have your notes and at this point, you have only though the time physically of in the real time for the slides to be on the screen while the test is going. And I'm not posting them. I've said that again, I'll send you an email to remind you all I promise to do that. That'll probably be by Friday that I'll be sending you uh, by Sunday morning, you know, uh, the test PDF itself for you to print out and you know download and print out. And then I'll remind you that the deadline will be midnight the night of the test and how to submit the, the uh, PDFs for the exam as well as the fact that I'm not posting the exam on YouTube. I did when I taught only in uh, online classes. I gave people, I think, 24 hours or something like that. But that isn't fair to the in-person class who will have actually barely two hours. But you'll have that a little extra time in case you need to convert things, which they won't do because they're going to do hand-printed answers right on their tests. That's how we used to do it <laughs> in the old days. So those, of course, don't need to be converted. So in some ways that balances it as best I can do. But but don't don't then send me an email, you know, the next day say, where's the exam? Uh, it's not on YouTube. It's, it's not gonna be posted. Everybody's clear on that, I hope. And anything else, obviously now is the time to ask. Any questions relating to anything we just covered about the review uh, process and the reduction of the slides. I think I covered that pretty well, right? Um, and the reduction of the list of terms or how the test is going to be administered. I think we did have one or two people join us late, so I don't want to have to repeat everything, but I can answer basic questions or anything else about the um, rest of the, you know, what we covered earlier before the break, the last few Roman slides. Obviously, if you weren't here, then you need to just watch that video before you start studying for the test. Yes. Sure, week six, all right, sure. That's a very specific question. I can definitely answer exactly that. Okay, so for those of you who want to be 100% sure, you can flip down to the bottom of page two. We're only crossing off two slides from week six. Female figure from Cyclades, right? And uh, beehive tomb at Mycenae from Greece. Don't forget the slides will start, hit the screen at uh, 645, so don't, don't log in you know, at 644, you want to be, you know, centered is the phrase actors used to use. My dad was an actor. He did several movies, Hollywood movies. Black Sheep, anybody heard of Black Sheep with Chris Farley and David Spade? He has a scene in that with Chris Farley. Anyway, he used to say, I'd go to auction, not auctions, uh, auditions with him. And he'd say, don't talk to me, I'm centering. It's an actor's cliche, of course, about what you should do before a test and a contest of any kind. And that test is a kind of a 
obviously a challenge of sorts, but you'll have your notes. So you guys have it a little bit easier, I hope, to ask than uh, other classes used to when we were all in person. Okay, any other questions? Now is a good time to ask um, about the test or about your grades, other than telling you your grade live in front of everyone else. If you if you want to email me, I'll tell you how many points you have, of course. I have a uh, quick question. Uh, I get off work at six o'clock. By the time it takes me to get home, it's about 635. If I'm about five minutes late to class, is that going to be okay? Or uh, is it, are you starting the test right at 630? Oh, I have to begin to give people the maximum time. Let's see, that gives you what a, you get home at six. So all I can, uh, the very important question and the best I can think of to answer that is hopefully you can have something pre-made that you can, I don't care if you eat during the test, obviously, or whatever it is you would normally do, but I hope that gives you enough time, 10 minutes to, to log on. You'll, you'll have the information, the log on information, or maybe you can have someone log on for, I don't know, if you have someone at home who can at least log on for you on your I'm own. Sure I'm sure, I'll make sure to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, I would just plan ahead. And, and I kind of have to show the, start the first slide at 645, but it has, there's two minutes. So if you're like 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 seconds late, you'll still have enough time. Believe me, people won't need more than a minute for if you know the slide and it'll be something you can look at from the textbook or you know whatever other source you use. Some people actually make flashcards, but I, I'm not assuming you all want to do that. Um, Levi, okay, so, well, that's a problem. I, I think what I just said to the other person who asked is, uh, that night you should plan on whatever you know is necessary to be sitting in front of your laptop by 642 even uh because you don't need much time right but once you log on but i will send the information to you by uh 620 at the latest so if you're somewhere or have someone at you know when you are heading i'm not sure if the person levi's if you're saying you're heading home from work or something well you could at least have the log on you know, if someone's at home, if you could do that. I don't know. I've actually had students tell me that's how I come up with that idea or suggestion that that may be their one of their family members can at least log on on to, with a laptop. So once you get into your whatever room it is, you're going to sit down in front of your laptop. It, you'll have, you know, the, the lecture already live streaming. That's the best I can suggest. I do kind of have to stick to the schedule. Um, I don't know what else to add to that on that one point. So hopefully that night you can, uh, whatever, head home earlier than usual in time to get back to your house by six or apartment by 640 or 642 even. That would give you enough time for the first slide hits the screen and it'll be there for two minutes. So hopefully the, that'll work. But yeah, like I said, I, I have to keep it to the same requirements. I already did this with the test for Art 1.2 with a much bigger class. And uh, everyone signed on that night. But guess what? Five of them didn't send their test in. 35 people, not one who dropped out early. For some reason, they sat there, looked at the slides. They were logged on. I can see their names on the you know, right-hand corner. And then they didn't turn their test in. I can't help anyone who does that. So what can I say? They can make up 60 points though. Of all of you have that option for any assignment that you might not do your best for any reason. 60 points is a significant jump in your extra, uh, I mean, your total points or point total towards your grade. So that could make up for perhaps if you didn't get the first slide, if you got to your laptop by 648 or something and you missed one of the first the first slide or even two you could make that well, more than make that up with the extra credit there is that fallback for everybody in all my classes okay so that might be a backup for but let's hope it's not necessary for anybody the people that are saying they barely get back in time hopefully you can just leave a little early from wherever you're heading home before on that night so you'll be home by 640 ish or at least in time to see the first slide on the screen at 6.45. Okay, any other questions? Now's the time to ask. Um, uh, could you just go over the week four slides that we were cutting sure. out? I got one of them, but I'm just missing the oh, other. Sure, 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 absolutely. Uh, both of them were crossed out because we didn't cover them. Okay, so- Nine seconds, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> the slides will be on the screen for two whole minutes. And uh, at, at some point, you know, 
what can I say, that you do want to be not more than maybe 60 seconds late because that, that would give you a whole minute. I used to only give people a minute. That's what Sarah Gill used to do, one minute to identify, I think it was 10 slides. It's, she, her tests were much more cumbersome than mine. She was department chair when I was hired and that was the standard. You had to diagram Greek temples and Gothic cathedrals with 20 different terms with arrows. We don't make you do that. So you guys get a bit of a break there. Yeah, so nine seconds, no problem. 90, you might have only 30 seconds then, but again, you probably could do that. So try to be uh, logged on by 6.40 five if you can at the latest all right uh, week four i'm sorry that person was asking i got sidetracked week four there's only two slides listed we crossed them both off miwok roundhouse because we didn't cover them and pomo ceremonial feather regalia so neither of those will be on the midterm i will show them to you before the final but i'm probably not going to test you on them because you know that's, that's something that we thought you know at some point we were going to look at before the uh, midterm but we, we haven't had a chance so right. those are not on the midterm. So that reduces the list when you add those two in the total by 22 slides that we just crossed off. Okay, thank you. If that helps, you're welcome. Anybody else? Now's a good time because uh, next time I see you all will be as I'm giving you a little pep talk. That's what I usually do and reminding you of what the procedural requirements are for the midterm before the first slide hits the screen at 645. Uh, okay, that's fine. If you can ask, ask it now, that would be good. <laughs> Go ahead. Unless you yeah, ask. sorry. I was trying to turn on my camera. Um, I just wanted to see if you could identify and tell me the name of this place in Milan, Italy. Oh, let's see if I can see well, let me see if I can get up close. Oh, I think I know what it is. Oh, yeah, I know what that is. That is a detail of the largest Gothic church, some say in the world, but one of the two largest in the world. The other would be Cologne Cathedral. That's Milan Cathedral. You know, if you know Italy, it sounds like you might have some. Have you been there? Have you been to Italy? Oh, no. So that could be extra credit in some way, but only if you were there during the semester and you took, it doesn't matter if you took the picture, but it would be best if it's one you took. So I don't assume that's why you're showing it to me, but you can- No, I just thought it was really, really cool. I saw it on somebody's social media. Oh, it's- a it's an incredible structure. It was the largest Gothic church in the world until the Germans finished Cologne Cathedral in the city of that name, which became even taller and therefore larger. But that's still pretty impressive. That building is mind blowing. Yeah, if you ever see a documentary on it, or even it's in several books. Yeah, it's, it's Milan Cathedral. It's a Gothic church in a country that didn't care for Gothic architecture because they had the Roman ruins and they preferred the romantic, uh, or, or sorry, I meant uh, classic, neoclassic style. And that's what the Renaissance was. So that's a rare building in more ways than one, being the largest Gothic church of its time, as in actually built and completed and opened during the Middle Ages. Yeah, it's right in the heart of Milan, which is a beautiful city. Yep, that's what that is. So that, Dan, you could get some extra credit by um, checking out a documentary, for instance, if that interests you. There are good documentaries about probably even just on that building. And uh, if you watch one, you remember that 10 points is everyone has the same option. All you have to do is write about two pages about what you learned about that work of art, that period, that artist, and you get 10 points. Okay, thanks for sharing that with us. All right, anybody else? Um, one more time just to return to, doesn't matter really now, but... Uh, uh, we still have a little bit of time left before I, I mean, actually more than that, up to 10 more minutes if people still have questions. Now, this is a new, I haven't seen it do this, this wide screen. It's like some DVDs, right? Wide screen or narrow? Okay, anybody with questions you have at all about anything, not just the test or what we covered tonight, your, your extra credit options or grading. Okay, anybody else? Because... I'm going to sign off here in a moment, unless somebody still has. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. What? The the test the test the time is uh, by the forty five six forty five p.m. Meaning fifteen minutes after we usually start the class, I will put the first slide on the screen. But I will be visible. You'll see me. It's at. Uh, you know, right about 6.30 or 6.32, I think is when I usually sign on, right? To give people a chance to sign on if they arrive a little later. Levi's iPad to everybody. Somebody, 
is that something I should address for people's information? Or if you just want to keep it between your fellow students, that's fine with me. But otherwise, for me, the easiest way to answer questions is like I just did uh, verbally. Okay, is that clear to you, the one who asked about the starting time? Meaning the first slide will hit the screen at uh, you know your laptops or your computer screen at um, uh, 6.45. Okay. I'm not... I guess I do have actually have one question. Sure. There's been a couple times like today, uh, I was logged in and then I got logged out real quick uh, out of Zoom. And then you added me to the class perfectly fine. I just wanted to make sure if that happened, uh, are you gonna be checking to add people yes, back into the class? I know. It's it's a, it's a, okay, cool. A good point and an important uh, fact that I am aware of. Uh, the first time I taught with Zoom three semesters ago, I guess, I didn't always monitor that as closely as I have ever since, so I learned not to do that. Yeah, it, the good thing about, I like this system, I must say, I mean, if someone from my period of American culture can master this in one semester, I mean master, at least become competent, uh, it must be a pretty user-friendly system because it, as you might know, I don't know if any of you have been hosting because you have to be a host, I think, but to see the list, the drop-down list, and when someone is trying to get back on or didn't get on yet is joining late, it, it shows up on my screen and it's uh, please admit, you know, so I, I won't ignore that. I'll be very careful. I'm not sure what you're referring to, Levi, if it's something between each of you students because I don't see a question for me, but if you want me to ask, Yes, uh, I think I mentioned this, didn't I? Or did you just, or is that, because I had several people ask at the beginning of tonight before we even got to the first slide, that sometimes things get sent uh, without this exactly clear title or email handle that matches what I have in my records for each student. And when that happens, it's not the disaster you might think. It just means that if you didn't get confirmation or you have a question to confirm, you want to confirm about your paper being received, let alone a grade if you've already received it, I mean already, sorry, sent it, so then you you, you should resend it. And it'll be obvious if you send it on time because there'll be the uh, time mark as uh, all emails have that you, you met the deadline. And if it was late, then it's a few points off. But yeah, if in other words, if you're sure you sent something in and you haven't heard from me by say Friday because I'm still grading some, well, let's say even Thursday, 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 uh, then you can email me and I will go back and double check, but, but then you should resend it. You really should just resend it as a PDF. And then I will confirm when I get it and I will grade that email or that, sorry, attachment uh, within 24 hours. So my goal is to get you all your grades back from the uh, papers that were turned in on time, no later than the end of this week. Okay, by uh, let's say 7 p.m. at the latest on Friday, okay? Yeah, that's good, that, that, that should work. Yeah, and I'll see it tomorrow, not tonight. It's already <laughs> an 11 hour day here. Uh, okay, but now again, I'm not disappearing until I, I know everyone's had a chance to ask questions that needs to have an answer live and, and uh, real time. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, that I can answer other than by email. You know, you can always do that. People have asked about their point totals. Anytime during the semester, send me an email asking for that and you'll get a response from me within usually 24 hours, which will have both the, five, the points as of that date up to that day and your letter grade, what that would mean. You know, and, and then if you're not at an A, I will almost give you always, uh, I think I always do, a little a reminder, you still have X points. Nobody's done extra, well, a few people have done a few points, but hardly anybody's done more than 10 points extra credit. So most of you have that option still hanging out there in space that you have an exercise. So consider that, uh, you know, because you have until final exams week to turn in any extra credit for up to 60 points. Okay. Have I answered everybody's questions for now? Anybody else? Okay, and I'll be checking any email questions like confirming receiving a, a paper or a grade by, uh, by tomorrow evening, okay? If you send me an email before five tomorrow, if you didn't already. Okay, is that it, everybody? All right, that's it. All right, we'll see you guys next week when the test is on. And don't forget that there are slides after the uh, exam's over that you will need to take notes on. Okay, good night. <laughs>